All right, are we starting up Facebook? Hello, YouTube. Nice to see you. There we go. There we go. Hello, my friends. It's Jill Osborne from the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, March 24th of 2024. And we're going to try to do a support meeting. We're going to try because for those, for my followers, you know that I've had a crazy year. The craziest thing happened yet. A week ago last Friday, I had emergency surgery. I can show you the incision. Woo! <laughs> So I had COVID six weeks ago, and then suddenly at the end of a neighborhood meeting that I was at, I had terrible chest pain that radiated through my sternum, under my breasts, through my back. Long story short, my gallbladder did a runner. It decided it did not like the safety of my belly. It demanded that it be released. The way it did that is by throwing giant, giant gallstones, one of which got blocked got stuck and ended up blocking everything. So had a fabulous uh, meeting with a wonderful rescue crew, fire crew, who came out to my house. So I was going to drive myself to the ER as I have been known to do that. Hi, Marlia. I realized I wasn't capable of walking, much less driving. So I called 911. An ambulance came. And they took me to the hospital, and I thought I was, I thought I had a COVID uh, blood clot in my heart. So I had COVID. The pain was so severe; it was like the only natural thing I could say, I could assume. It wasn't. My gallbladder was filled with gallstones, and it was blocked. So after a good twelve hours in the emergency room, they sent me up to emergency surgery, and I am now here today. <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh. <laughs> Laughing is perilous. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, uh, because I missed our meeting last week, obviously, I wanted to at least come come by and say hi, answer any questions if anybody has, and um, show you our latest magazine. Um, that said, something very interesting did happen. Um. <sighs> So here I am in my living room, fire crew is here, my heart is racing, my blood pressure is very high, the pain is off the charts, I can barely walk. And I had a paramedic say, do you have anxiety? And I remember he was standing at the entrance, there were about five guys here, uh, and they knew me because they were the crew who came out when my, both when my dad passed away and my mom passed away a year ago. So I knew them well. They're like, we know you. You're Jack's daughter, Jill. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. So anyway, one of them was standing at the entry to my living room and said, are you sure this isn't anxiety disorder? And I said, how do you normally feel anxiety? And I remember sitting there and I'm hunched over like this. And I'm kind of looking at him going, um, how do I normally feel anxiety? an anxiety attack, um, I have to go to the bathroom. I get the runs. <laughs> and I was just baffled that he said that to me because I, got, I was like in severe pain here, in which the hospital, you know, later confirmed was actually an acute gallbladder attack. So I'm going to send them a letter, a thank you letter for caring so much for me. They were great. The ambulance crew was great. And um, uh, I'm not going to even mention that. It wasn't worth it. But I just want to say thank you for, for everything they did for me. And for Kaiser Hospital, for the emergency room doctors, um, who uh, they just put me in a room, sent me off for tests. They, I was getting ready to do a, con, uh, uh, a, an I, a IV contrast CAT scan when a guy comes running in and says, yeah, she canceled it. She found it. The sonogram found all the, found that my gallbladder was doing so well. So on a scale of one to 10 right now, my pain is about a four. 
if I stretch, probably because I vacuumed yesterday when I wasn't supposed to, but I couldn't stand my, my, my uh, dirty house. So I'm not a mess. So I'm perfectly safe to do a support group meeting and cer certainly safe to take questions. And the really good news here is sitting doesn't hurt. Sitting at my computer here is actually one of the easiest things for me to do right now. It's hard is getting in and out of a recliner. So um, what we're going to do uh, today is if you have questions, I'm really, really happy to questions. But I want to start with what I had hoped to share with you uh, two weeks ago. I just didn't have a printed copy of it. And that is our latest magazine. The IC Optimist. So the IC Optimist is a quarterly magazine for the IC network members. And my goal with this with this publication is for you within five minutes to find something that you will find useful. And this is a very, very interesting issue. You know, this is where we do our best work. So for example, in this magazine, we have my lead article for the magazine is a curious link between bladder inflammation and depression based upon new research. Let's talk about that for a moment. So we had a brand new research study that came out about three weeks ago. And it was able to make a direct correlation between the bladder being irritated consistently on a daily basis with depression. Now, I found that absolutely fascinating because what they were able to determine is that when the bladder is irritated consistently over time, obviously you get localized inflammation of the bladder wall. So let's say you're a green tea drinker. Let's say you're a soda drinker. Let's say you drink energy drinks or Mountain Dew or something like that, which we know is going to be very, very irritating. Is there a consequence to you drinking something or eating something that we know can be very, very irritating? And so, again, when you irritate the bladder wall over time, because you got to remember, your bladder was designed for life tens of thousands of years ago. Your, when your bladder was designed, we did not have green tea and soda. We didn't have daily consistent acid raining down on the bladder wall throughout the day. We just didn't. So our bladder defenses only go so far. When you're younger, you have a lot of estrogen. If you're a woman, then yeah, you're gonna be able to get away with more. But as you get a little bit older, estrogen levels drop, your bladder's just not gonna be able to do that. Do, do a lot. So now we've got consistent daily irritation. That irritation and that inflammation spreads locally. So we'll go from the bladder wall to deeper into the tissue. Then it will spread regionally. So then we're going to start seeing inflammation farther away from the bladder, originally caused by that bladder injury. We call this the pepperoni pizza algorithm. We have research that shows that if you irritate the bladder, the bowel will also show signs of irritation. If you irritate the bowel, the bladder also shines of irritation. That, for, that was from research like 18 years ago. Why did that happen? Because they have shared nerves. Shared nerves. Um, the way they determine that is they put radioactive tracers in the bladder and in the bowel, and they followed them, and they all merged at the spinal cord into the same nerve root. So we know that the nerves are shared. That inflammation, if it persists, will eventually affect the spinal cord. We're, we're, so we're transitioning from kind of skin irritation, tissue irritation to neuroinflammation. Now we have nerves that are inflamed and that neuroinflammation has the potential of going up the spinal cord directly into the brain where that has been linked to depression. So this was, I mean, it really makes you ponder. A lot of our life right now is, you know, we're really all coming to grasp with uh, the consequences of kind of mass produced food and stuff like that. And the things that we've been putting in our body for the last 50 years, are they healthy? Or are they not healthy? And a lot of the food that we've eaten and we continue to eat are really not healthy. And so anyway, 
my editorial is an article that talked very, very specifically about this new research. And as I, um, as I said in my conclusion, have you ever considered why so many diseases have increased exponentially after World War II? Well, that's when manufacture, manufactured foods became established, and we now face a reckoning for the toll that they have taken on our bodies and, yes, our minds. If I could go back in time, I, would, I wouldn't have picked up the sodas, the tasty Oreos, and the Twinkies of my childhood. I'm sure that the diet intensified my urinary and bowel symptoms over time. Then throw in the wicked levels of stress we've endured in the past several years due to the pandemic, politics, and war. It's no wonder that so many are struggling with their health. So it's time to simplify. I cleaned up my diet substantially. And let me tell you, I'm not allowed to eat fats for two months. <laughs> now I can't even eat my favorite coconut milk anymore. Um, I'm already eating much less red meat and many more veggies and fruits. That's very true. And as much as I love a good cinnamon roll, I'm saying no to pastries and I've chosen not to drink alcohol this year. Um, anyway, so if you're a member of the IC network, you can already, you can already get, you already either have received this in the mail or you downloaded it from your uh, page. Our second article is an interview with the Herman Wallace Institute. The Herman Wallace Institute is the organization that conducts the certification of physical therapists in pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic floor care, pelvic care. Um, this is why, you know, 10 years ago, we had very few physical therapists and now we have, how many did they say? Um, they had, let's see, they were founded in 2006. They've trained 21,518 therapists. Um, 14,000 have taken their introductory pelvic floor class. 720 have received their full pelvic floor rehabilitation. I always tell patients, especially patients who are more complex, especially uh, patients who have uh, more traumatic injuries, signs of pudendal neuralgia, that you always want to find a fully certified physical therapist, even if it means you've got to travel an hour to get there. Okay. Some of you may remember from a couple weeks ago, we talked about the central sensitization inventory. How sensitive are you? We're not using sensitive in a weaponized way. It's about how sensitive are your nerves? How injured are your nerves? So we have a fabulous quiz on this to help you figure out how sensitive you are. Um, we've got the current clinical trials. We've got two clinical trials right now seeking patients struggling with bladder pain. We've got another third clinical trial, another clinical trial coming down the pipeline uh, that I will be working with very quickly, and I will be sharing that with you. Um, Stacy Shannon, our wonderful writer, talking with your children about IC. This is very important. Uh, several years ago, really like maybe five years after I started the IT network, I had a, a young mother call me who was devastated to learn that her daughter thought she was dying. Her daughter thought her IC was killing her. She found her daughter sobbing in pain in her bedroom and asked why. And she said, Mommy, please don't die. You're going to die, aren't you? And she realized that she didn't explain what was happening to her child, and her child began. Uh, worrying unnecessarily. And so it's very, very important that we remember that children in our homes are going to see and hear everything. So we've got to make sure that we take the fear out of it. We've got a great article on that. Uh, great consumer alert. What's in your bottle of water? Wiener skincare. Why am I diet sensitive if my pelvic floor is the problem? And of course, a fabulous a fabulous article on pancakes, Saturday morning pancakes. Um, so if you like our live support group meetings, if you like our recordings, it's really, really great if you come and become a member of the IC Network. You'll get our great magazine, which is where I do my best work. Absolutely, 100%. My best work is always in the magazine. And it helps us do these meetings. Oh, I'm squirmy. Hold on, I'm squirmy. Hi, Carts. Hi, Crafty. Good to see you. Oh, slowly. 
is that I feel like my belly is being held together by staples, even though there's no staples, there's only glue. Five incisions on my belly right now. Now, the other interesting thing, let me see if I can find this really quick. Is This is something that I really, really love to see every year. Is the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. Um, here, hold on. Okay, so the Environmental Working Group is a nonprofit that I absolutely love. And what they try to do is they try to educate us to help us understand and minimize, reduce the risk of pesticides in foods. Um, and the, what, so what they do is they go through our national FDA crop testing and they publish uh, two lists. They publish the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. So the, here, hold on a sec. Let me, so the 12 fruits and vegetables that are the most consistently contaminated with pesticides, and we encourage you to eat organic versions of these rather than over-the-counter versions of these, uh, strawberries. Strawberries, so unorganic, regular strawberries top the list as having the most contamination. Let me see what they said here. The Environmental Working Group found 90% of samples taken from most fruits on the list tested positive for at least two kinds of pesticides. A single sample of kale, collard, or mustard greens had up to 21 different pesticides. On average, spinach samples had 1.8 times as much pesticide residue by weight as any other crop tested. Um, uh, last year, the Biden administration banned the use of chloropyrifos, a pesticide associated with brain damage in children. There remain dozens, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so let's look at the, the dirty dozen. So what they say is these are the foods you should always try to buy organic. Strawberries, spinach, kale, collard, and mustard greens, nectarines, any of the thin-skinned fruit, apples, absolutely apples. I only buy organic apples for sure because the skins are so thin. Uh, or if you have a farmer's market, or if you've got a local farm that you can support where you know they're not a, 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 a farm that's using a heavy level of pesticides, that would be great. Grapes, bell peppers, hot peppers, cherries, peaches, pears, celery, and tomatoes. So those are the foods, again, that they say um, uh, you should buy organic. Um, the clean 15 are the foods that mostly have peels, skins, or husks that are removed before consumption. So the clean 15 is an example. The foods that you, they say you can buy regular, you don't have to buy them organic, are going to be avocados, sweet corn, papaya, onions, kiwi, cabbage, mangoes, um, and uh, mushrooms and asparagus. So anyway, feel free to Google Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen so that you can look at that list, uh, especially if you have young children. I remember last year they were talking very specifically about raisins and that like 100% of the raisins that were tested, again, not by them, this is by the U.S. government, 100% of the raisins tested back then, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, had really significant pesticide contamination. But they were also stunned to find that organic raisins, that the great majority, over 90% of the organic raisins also had significant pesticide contamination. So I think it's important that we up our game. We try to be informed, try to support local farmers, look at these lists, go for the clean 15 whenever you can, and try to avoid those thin-skinned um, fruits and vegetables that are more likely to absorb the pesticide through the skin and into the meat of the fruit. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, at the top of the list was potatoes. Um, and that pound for pound, there was like, a, 
it, again, this was a few years ago. There's just a massive amount, pound for pound, of pesticide in the middle of the potato. So when you peel it, you're not getting rid of the pesticide. So that's why I also only buy organic potatoes. Okay, so anyway, that's it. That's my thing here. Let's go ahead and take some of your questions. So we're simulcasting live right now on Facebook and YouTube. And um, over here, so when I'm looking over here on the left, I'm looking at YouTube. When I'm looking here, I'm looking at Facebook. Um, so Cardsy says, that looks like a gallbladder scar. Yes, it is. If anybody wants to see it, I'll show it to you. Hey, man, I'm proud. I got through it. Woo! My big one's up here. So there's, there's, there's one of them. This one, this one, one right here in my belly button, and then there's one over on that side too. And I'm also still really swollen down there. <sighs> Okie dokie, artichokey. Brighton, Brighter says, haven't been diagnosed with IC, but the symptoms fit. This information is so important for people in general who are concerned about their foods as well. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Absolutely it is. Because a lot of the health issues that we have right now are, are related to really terrible food problems over time. All right. Hello, Margie. Margie says, thank you for, I hope you're feeling better. Hello, Marlia. I'm trying. Hi, Gay. Hi, Lori. Judy, is vulvodynia common with this? And what would be the treatment? Yes, vulvodynia is extremely common with us. I'm a former vulvodynia patient. We're always going to look at the commonalities between this. And generally, the connection between IC and IBS is either very, very sensitive nerves or very, very tight muscles. So we're always today now looking, we're really focusing on the concept of cause versus effect. So the vulva symptoms that you have are an effect. We have to try to figure out what could be driving those vulvodynia symptoms. So you guys... Vulvodynia means that you feel like you have a yeast infection all the time. For me, when I had severe vulvodynia in high school, it felt like I had a yeast infection all the time. And yet the doctor would look at my skin and say, you're perfectly normal. And, and yet I was, I should have had stock in monostat all the time, all the time. I had vulvar symptoms. Sometimes they were so severe, I couldn't wear jeans. I couldn't wear pants. I couldn't wear underwear. Why? Well, we're going to look first at nerve sensitivity, that the, that the nerves in the skin have become very, very sensitive, also known as widespread pain. That's that phenotype. The second thing we're going to look for is pelvic floor tension, because if those muscles are super, super tight in the pelvic floor, they're going to squeeze the nerves, they're going to squeeze the blood vessels that support the vulva. My vulvodynia pain was in my perineum mostly. And what I didn't know is that there was an attachment point for four muscles immediately above the perineum called the perineal body. And that's why I had vulvodynia pain was because my muscles were so tight. Um, and then also, if you happen to be a bit older, we're going to look for estrogen atrophy too, dryness. Hello, Boria. Hi, Lori. Lori's in a flare. Ow. Okay. It got better and came back after, you know what? Okay, got it. My doctor said I may have an ulcer. My only symptom is burning after I urinate, lasting for about 20 minutes. So Lori, if that burning happens to be uh, on the vulva in your urethra, or if your urine feels hot, then we're always going to be looking at estrogen atrophy of your skin down there, or we're going to be looking at pelvic floor tension. Uh, pain before urination. Pain is your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. You feel better after you pee. That's that's pointing to the bladder wall. But if your worst pain is after you're done peeing or while you're peeing, we're going to look at very, very different things. If your urine feels hot, like it's burning you as it's coming out, we know exactly what that is. That's estrogen atrophy. Hi, Lisa. Marlia says, I'm the type of person when I get upset, my face flushes and I feel hit. And I often have, yeah, you often go to the bathroom. 
is that a fight or flight thing? Um, yeah, it is a uh, fight or flight. What happened? Raises your heart rate, raises your blood pressure, tightens your muscle and prepare, uh, tightens your muscles and prepares you to fight. If you tell me I've got to get on a plane tomorrow, I can promise you I'll be up all night uh, peeing and pooping. That's how my body reacts to stress. That's how my body reacts to fight or flight. So yeah, that's the way I would look at that. And if you, she says, I do have atrophy and you're dry as hell. So, it, so this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Why are you damned if you do? If you're dry as hell, that's, that means your skin is dry. That means estrogen, uh, using some topical estrogen, estrogen cream is the way to go. That will help that skin tremendously. Lori, Lori said, do you have an ulcer in your bladder, honey? The symptom of Hunter's ulcers is not pain after urination. The symptom of Hunter's ulcers is agony when your bladder is very full and you feel better after you pee. So I really doubt that's a symptom of a Hunter's ulcer. Tarnisha says, happy Sunday, everybody. In my city, there's a wait list for pelvic floor physical therapy. Yeah, you know, Tarnisha, I was working with somebody a couple of days ago because uh, I'm kind of back. I'm doing some coaching over the phone. Um, I'm slowly getting getting myself back together here to try to try to be a little bit more productive. And she was saying the same thing. I think she was in um, Fremont, California, and that there was a wait list in, three, in Fremont, California, also. Uh, a great way, a great place to find physical therapists is on a website, pelvicrehab.com, pelvicrehab.com. Hello, Holly. Hello, Kayleen. Kayleen is at the emergency room. Girl, keep me posted. Holly says, what's the best IC diet? Well, Holly, it depends upon what your phenotype is. Because let's say you have, a, if you're a Hunter's lesion patient, which is really basically just 5% of patients, Hunter's lesions are basically big bleeding wounds on the bladder wall. Uh, Hunter's lesions we know are now caused by viral infections at the bladder wall, like Epstein-Barr or polyoma. So working with the patient before all this surgery happened, who actually was actively positive for Epstein-Barr and Lyme disease at exactly the same time, and she had Hunter's lesion. So patients who have open wounds on their bladders are going to be the patients who will have the strictest diet limitation. Um, um, our second phenotype is bladder wall driven. So these are the patients where there is something else happening with the bladder wall. There can be a chemical injury to the bladder. Um, and so these are the patients who are drinking or going through chemotherapy or they're drinking a lot of soda, stuff like that. That has the potential of causing daily consistent irritation to the bladder. And so for these patients, we want to figure out what the irritant is, back off on the irritant, eliminate it completely. And then modify the diet for a couple of months to really give the bladder an opportunity to heal because the bladder is the slowest healing organ in the body. Estrogen atrophy patients are patients who are on birth control, they're on Lupron for endometriosis, or you're just getting older. Um, and that is where the bladder simply does not have enough estrogen to produce that nice thick coating of mucus, which normally protects your bladder wall from foods, irritating foods like orange juice. Cranberry, things like that. Okay, I'm squirming. Just bear with me. Um, these patients are going to be on the IC diet long term uh, because their bladder just doesn't have the resources it needs to defend itself. And so for these patients, we're really going to be looking at um, uh, no coffee, no green tea, no soda, no cranberry, no orange, no lemonade, no, no limeade. We want to eliminate these top, top, top at, um, daily irritants. Also a multivitamin, a traditional multivitamin, a mass market multivitamin that you might get at a local store. So are well known to be daily consistent irritators. So it's really the estrogen atrophy patient and the Hunter's lesion patients who are, gonna, who are going to need to follow the diet the most. Our third subtype is pelvic floor driven. We now know that 85% of IC patients are really not bladder wall patients at all. They're pelvic floor, they're neuromuscular patients. 
Their symptoms usually began after a physical trauma, falling off of a car. I mean, falling off of, of a bicycle. I was working with a patient two days ago who um, she she just she was checking every pelvic floor box as we're talking, and I was just like going, okay. The risk, biggest risk factor for pelvic floor is childhood athletics. So uh, in her case, she was an ice skater and a gymnast, and she fell a lot. And every time you fall on your tailbone, every time you fall on your hip, every time you traumatize the pelvic floor, we're just going to see a slow and steady increase in injury. Those muscles are potentially going to get tighter and tighter and tighter over time. So these patients, yes, they are going to have some food sensitivity, but it's kind of a backdoor sensitivity. The reason why pelvic floor patients might be food sensitive is because their bladder simply isn't getting enough blood flow to be healthy. So they're in a state of what we call ischemia. And so if your bladder is supposed to get 24 units of blood a day and it's only getting 10, are you going to have a healthy bladder wall? And the answer, of course, is no, you're not. But once we fix those muscles, restore blood supply, get the bladder exactly what it needs to heal, that food sensitivity should go away. Like I can drink lemonade now. I can drink and I can eat any pasta that I want now. I can eat tomato sauce now. I couldn't for years. I can now because I've done physical therapy and I've fixed my underlying issue, which was in fact neuromuscular in origin. Phenotype number four, phenotype number four is um, um, uh, pudendal neuralgia. These are patients who have positional symptoms. They're fine when they stand, but when they sit down, it hurts. Or when they bend over, it hurts. Or they might have pins and needles. Or they might have areas of numbness. Or they might have PGAD, persistent genital arousal disorder, where you feel a sense of uh, a, a sudden arousal sensation, but it's not a pleasant arousal sensation. And you don't want to tell anybody because it's so embarrassing. It's actually not embarrassing. That's a sign that we have a nerve that's compromised. That's all. Uh, so for these patients, again, we might see a little bit of diet sensitivity. And because their nerves are tweaked, we don't really want to do a lot of coffee because coffee tweaks nerves. Then our last subtype, widespread pain, chronic overlapping pain conditions. These are patients who have IC, IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, migraines, fibromyalgia. I mean, this is my subtype. And so for us, our therapeutic priority is to actually work on the central nervous system. If we can calm the central nervous system down, a lot of these symptoms will go away. And for us, our biggest diet issue is going to be anything that's neurostimulatory, specifically caffeine and or chocolate. So you couldn't pay me. Well, you could. Okay, now I'm going to take that back. If you want to give me $100,000 to eat a chocolate bar, I'll do it. I'll be in the bathroom for three days with terrible cramps, but, it, but I'm willing to take that risk. But it's not worth 50 bucks to me. That's all. That's for sure. You can learn a lot more about the IC diet over on the IC Network website, which is icnetwork.org. Also, please know we have a wonderful book, the IC Chef Cookbook. Let me see. Here it is. So this is a great resources, resource to have. Uh, if you're just learning about the diet, it's filled with recipes that have been tested by many, many patients. Uh, these are recipes that patients submitted from us. The other cool thing about this, uh, we have a lot of recipes for drinks and for foods and meal, you know, you name it, it's in here, but lots of hot drink and cold drink recipes. Uh, we have the ingredients which often cause the problems, the most bothersome foods, the least bothersome foods, and the IT Network food list. We have a, uh, a great food list on the IT Network. You know, one of the things that happens is that, hi, Donna, is that patients often get, a, get they become very, very afraid to eat. We don't want you to be afraid to eat. There's a ton of food you can eat out there. But there are some patients who basically stop eating. And they lose a massive amount of weight, and they end up malnourished. And so when we were all thinking uh, several years ago about what can we do for these patients, what, what can we do to help them understand that there is a lot of food you can eat. It might not be your favorite junk food, 
but that doesn't mean that you're going to, you're going to starve. You can't, what it means, we, we got to up your game. And so we have this extensive food list and we've got usually bladder friendly foods we're trying and foods to avoid. So as an example, uh, almonds, this is a good example, almonds, the usually bladder friendly, unsalted, organic, raw, roasted, or almond butter, like Zinke or a Blue Diamond. Foods we're trying, lightly seasoned almonds, like candied, caramel, or carob almonds. Foods to avoid, chocolate covered almonds, or heavily seasoned with, seasoned with hot chili flavoring and spices. Uh, another here's aloe. Um, foods we're trying aloe capsules. We're, we don't have them as usually bladder friendly because they don't agree with everybody. But we have we're trying maybe. Aloe is known to have a bit of a soothing effect to the bladder. It's not going to repair anything, but it can come in handy in a flare. We have the aloe that that we support is called aloe path. Um, allopath combines the soothing effect of aloe with the nerve calming effect of PEA. We have quite a few patients who use that for flares. Um, but we have, what we have here is foods to avoid. Aloe beverages containing risky ingredients such as vitamin C, maca, or camu. Uh, apples. Usually bladder friendly, sweet mild apples like Gala, Fuji, Pink Lady, Lady, um, you can make your own jam, jelly, pies, charts, and juice. Uh, foods we're trying, red or green delicious apples, but red or green delicious apples are known to be a bit more acidic and a little bit more irritating. Apples to avoid, sour or very tart apples like Granny Smith apples. So if you're really trying to get to the bottom of your, or of your food issues and you're also looking for more alternatives, get the IC Chef Cookbook. You can find that in the IC Network shop. Oh, oh let me tell you, bending over, not fun. Definite, definitely not fun. Ow, 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 ow. Oh. Wearing a bra, also hard when you have an incision right there. Okay. Michelle says, I'm having my second bladder installation tomorrow. I am in a five-day, 24-7 urgency flare. Last night, I unfortunately got very sick from Chinese food. It's hard enough to sleep with the urgency, let alone the nausea. So no sleep last night. I'm hoping this installation helps. It, it feels like it's my only hope. Do you think it's okay to get the installation? Well, honey, you didn't say what kind of installation it is. What is it? Is it a rescue? So is it going to be a combination of heparin and lidocaine? Absolutely. That would be reasonable. That would immediately turn off the nerves in your bladder wall. That's why we call it a rescue because you usually walk out feeling much, much better. It'd be nice to know what triggered the flare in the first place, though. Do you have any ideas as to what triggered it five days ago? And guys, please know that we have a wonderful 40 page flare management guide with hour by hour rescue plans. It will help you figure out the type of flare you have and what you can do to help minimize that flare. If you go on over to icnetwork.org, there'll be a pop up window within the first minute. You can sign up for our free newsletter. I promise you, I don't abuse you at all. We've got well over 30,000 patients who read our newsletter. Um, so I send out a newsletter maybe once every two months and I send out clinical trial announcements. That's really all I send out. So if you sign up for the newsletter, our gift to you is that flare management guide. It's uh, 40 pages. It's a $10 gift because we sell it for $10 in the IC network shop. Val says, what is the best bladder installation? <sighs> we, that's not the right question, honey. The, the right question is, what is the right treatment for your unique case of IC? So if, for example, your pelvic floor driven, bladder installations are pointless. If you have Hunter's lesions, bladder installations are pointless. If you have estrogen atrophy, a bladder installation can certainly help to calm your bladder down and break you out of a flare. 
Um, the most popular bladder installation in use today is what we call a rescue installation. It is heparin and lidocaine. DMSO is not the most popular install. It's on its way out. It's been on its way out for many years now. Um, why? Because um, it can cause involuntary uh, muscle spasms in the bladder wall. We have research that was presented two years in a row that showed that. And it has a lot of side effects. And it hurts. Having a DMSO installation can hurt. I had six or eight DMSO installations. Oh, you guys, by the way. Oh, where is it? What did I do with it? Oh, where did I put it? I found something really cool. Over here. Oh. Oh, here it is. Here it is. So back in the day, remember, my IC symptoms first began in seventh grade in 1974. Yes, I'm that old. And so this last week, as I've been recovering from surgery, my sister and I have been going through a bunch of a bunch of stuff. And what did we found? What did we find? We found my 1974 medical record from my doctor back then, Dr. Andrew Thusen, it's a lovely guy. So it's not the whole one. This is hysterical. Actually, it's 75. My first appointment was January 6, 1975. Um, my IVP cost $63. My cystoscopy cost, cost $72. My urethral dilation cost $18. Every time I had a urethral dilation, and believe me, I had many, it was an $18 charge. So look at that. Isn't that good? Isn't that so cool? There it is. The year my life changed with urinary symptoms, only to discover after the fact it was really never my bladder. It was always my pelvic floor that it all began after I broke my tailbone that year. Ow. Kayleen says, or hold on. Installations help me so much. I call it a soft blanket for my bladder. God, that's a great way to describe it. They're risk for pain, bleeding, and infection. I've been getting them monthly for the past four years, and this, this is the second time I've had an injury. Yeah, she, so Kayleen had an installation uh, last week and somehow the catheter got kinked to one side and it's it probably Kayleen just scraped your bladder and caused a wound in your bladder. I will tell you I had dozens and dozens of dilations and only once did that happen to me and that was when another doctor did it and says how am I feeling? I'm very tender. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. It's not pretty or sneeze or cough. Uh, if you have IC, can you take away BMED? Sure. You went to the Urogyno. I knew, I knew more than she did. Yeah. Holly says, I hate IC. Absolutely. We all hate pain. Hi, Anna. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Angie. Do Sjogren's have anything to do with C with CIS, Nancy? Yes. Uh, for there is uh, a, a much smaller subtype of patients with immune dysfunction. Um, so if you happen to have the Sjogren's, the lupus, and the IC, then that also puts you in a distinct group. Um, it has not been established as its own unique subtype, but obviously it is. So I was working with a patient again this week who... Um, it's my first coaching, as a matter of fact, after surgery, um, and I just couldn't not talk to her because um, she was really struggling. And so she had, uh, let's see, how do I want to say this? In case, in case you're watching, no, I love you, and I'm just going to use this as a, as a learning moment here. She, she was trying to figure out on her own what was wrong, what was wrong. And she decided to have a next generation DNA urine test, which is a test. So is a much better test in a urine culture. It will help identify really weird, unusual infections. Her infections I had never heard of. 
and, and guys, you know, my, my senior project when I, I was getting my drug development degree was in drug resistant infections. So I, I know a lot about different types of infections. She had three I'd never heard of before. They were really rare, really uncomfortable. One was associated with septicemia. One was associated uh, with a really, oh, a heart issue. And so she's like, what do I do? I've got these weird, I've got this, these weird bacteria. And I said to her, I said, that's got to be coming from somewhere. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, I've never worked with a patient with these three things. I said, is your immune system compromised? And if I remember correctly, I do think she said she had Sjogren's syndrome, which is autoimmune. And her IgG levels were very, very low. Her immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin levels were very, very low. And that's a sign that we've got a suppressed or compromised immune system. And I said, well, what did the doctor suggest for that? And they suggested IgG infusions, but she passed on that. She said, I don't want to do that. That's from other people. And it's like, you know, we had a pretty, pretty stern talking to that. Okay, now we know why you're picking up all these really funky, strange and very, very unusual infections. Your immune system is compromised. You cannot walk away from that. That has to be treated, if at all possible. And I encouraged her to go back to her rheumatologist and talk about those IgG infusions. Let's go here to YouTube but really quick. Um, Ryder Day says, do eggs have a bad result with IC? Absolutely not, unless you're allergic to eggs. Eggs are usually fine. Egg whites are natural acid reducers, so that's fine. Uh, brighter day so she has to pee like she has to pee every 45 minutes that tells me that your bladder wall is very very irritated and compromised so now we've got to figure out what's doing that are you in estrogen atrophy if you are then therapeutically we've got to improve that skin health so that those nerves are not so exposed and that's going to be with topical estrogen Brighter Day says, I've completely changed my diet. No meats, caffeine, no candy, and all organic. Excellent. The new slider sounds great. Yep. Hi, Diane. Thank you, Diane. Slowly. Diane says, I have terrible trouble with hemorrhoids, and I think my pelvic floor issues contributed to this. I'm going, going to get back with my pelvic floor physical therapist and also see a proctologist. Good. So hemorrhoids occur because you're straining. You're straining because your muscles are tight. Or there can be something else going on with your muscles. So I think getting back to physical therapy is very, very important for you right now. Uh, Diane says, I can't get the hemorrhoids to stop bleeding and hurting, so I'm not sure if I have to have surgery. I'm so terrified of this because I've heard hemorrhoid surgery is so painful. Girl, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, I myself have had a couple of pretty painful moments with hemorrhoids. Did they give you Proctofoam? Proctofoam. Proct so normally when you have hemorrhoids, they will give you a steroid suppository to use. I used many of them over the years and they were great. I mean, but you had to use them every day for like two weeks to really get everything calmed down there. But the last time it was happened, which was several years ago, the doctor instead gave me a little foam to insert called Proctofoam. Oh my God, it was great. So you can ask the doctor to see if if there's anything new on the market that would help calm some of the nerves and, and the pain that's coming from those hemorrhoids um, and ask for Proctofoam. See what they say about that. I will tell you as an example, my, my mother, God bless her, rest in peace, mama, um, had ginormous hemorrhoids. I mean, we're talking salad plate size, massive. And it was like, you know, and she'd been diagnosed with vulvodynia, all this sort of stuff. Um, and then one day, you know, I always gave her privacy because I cared for her and I cared for my parent, my father for a year. I cared for both of them for years. So I gave her her privacy in the bathroom and I never really peeked in. It's like, do what you need to do. If you need help, call me. But I didn't go in and observe, right? Well, I finally 
caught her. I think the door was slightly open. The mirror was there. And she, okay, I don't know if I can do this with my decision. She was like this on the toilet. And she was straining as hard as she could to poop. Which now helped me understand why that there was sometimes poop in front of the toilet and poop on the back of her legs. What, what are you doing? Mom, what are you doing? She said, well, I have to, this is how I poop. I feel like that. I feel like I have to have a bowel movement. And it got really worse in the last year of her life. And there's no doubt in my mind that those ginormous hemorrhoids that she had were from years of straining. And, you know, when I asked her about her bowel movements, it's like, I'm fine. And so I, I didn't explore further. And when we went to the doctor for her vulvodynia, you know, I was standing next to her doctor. The doctor always pulled me over, said, this is what we're dealing with. And we looked, I looked at her bottom. And she had significant hemorrhoids, maybe when they were at rest, they were maybe an inch and a half. But after she strained, they were so big you could see them peeking up out of her out of her butt crack. So I, I tell that to you as a lesson not to strain. If you're straining, we have to figure out why. Um, uh, are you not having enough fiber? Are you not drinking enough water? Are you passing hard rocks? That's a sign that not, not enough fiber, not enough water. Or are we dealing with very, very weak muscles and you just have to push hard to get them out? And guys, please know that this is what my mother wanted. My dad too. They wanted me to use them as an example. And so I'm not sharing those stories to humiliate her. She can't be humiliated. She's in heaven and she knows I love her. But I know that she's very proud to use her case as an example if we can save somebody else from suffering the way she suffered. Um, Anne says, how do you diagnose subtypes? Well, it's actually really easy to diagnose subtypes. It's based really about your symptoms. I can usually do it in about five minutes um, and give you a new set of questions to ask your doctor. Um, sometimes after meetings, we go into Zoom and I can phenotype patients uh, in a Zoom meeting if you guys wanted to do that. Anna says, I was wondering if you have a list of good specialists on pelvic floor in Europe. Finding it is difficult. Uh, go to pelvicrehab.com. That's the best list I've got, hon. Otherwise, you need to call the uh, the Belgian IC Association. I think there is one. You can check our list of uh, international IC groups. Um, but go to pelvicrehab.com first. Marlia says I use estradiolprim, but if I'm in fighter, if I'm in the fight or flight mess, I thought antihistamines were used to help, but it's it's drying. That's hmm. Um. Marlia, I don't understand why you're using antihistamines for fight or flight. I mean, a medication like Visteril can certainly have a calming effect. A med medication like um, uh, Valium can relax muscles that are tight from fight or flight. I don't know why you're using histamines other than it just kind of mellows you out. But if you're using so many histamines that it's making you very, very dry, then you're doing what I call chasing the symptoms. You're not getting to the underlying root cause. We've got to get through to the underlying root cause here. Tarnisha said coffee and tea is my irritant. Yeah. Tanya says sitting, watching you in pain, dog pulled me down net, and you have a fractured rib. Thank goodness it could have been where I know. My brother, uh, about a, a month ago, my brother got up at night, fell, uh, fell down next to his bed and hit his head on his bedside table and it knocked him out and he had fluid on his brain. 
Um, and of course he did not call 911. Of course he waited, like every macho guy will wait. And uh, now they're waiting for the fluid to go away. Tanya says, so the estrogen atrophy needs to follow the IC diet too. Is it because of the acid? It's because your bladder cannot defend itself well when you're in estrogen atrophy. Your bladder is more vulnerable. Your bladder's ability to protect itself from that acid is minimized because of your age and or lots of estrogen. Angie said, I ran across a girl in another support group who was looking for answers. I invited her here, so maybe she's listening, but all of her testing is normal. She's scheduled for a cystoscopy, but in talking with her, I found out her white blood count, her white blood cell count is high. Her testing strips at home show infection, but the doctor's office say no infection. I suggested Microgen DX. Can you elaborate on undetected UTIs at doctor's office and what Microgen can do? So Microgen Diagnostics is one of two companies in the United States that does next generation testing. Next generation DNA urine testing doesn't try to grow bacteria. It looks at DNA. The problem with the urine culture is it will only selectively grow the bacteria that eat the food in the culture. And the problem is, is bacteria, there are many different types of bacteria, eat many different types of food. So we all know, everybody knows urine cultures are flawed, but they're cheap. They're cheap and they're easy to do. And so medical care is based around urine cultures. The problem though, is that there are patients who consistently show negative on culture who are actively symptomatic. A good example of that in the IT community is fungal infection. That we have clear research from our own US government National Institute of Health IC research team that some IC patients struggling with severe bladder pain are doing it because they have a candida infection in their urine candida fungus and a urine culture for bacteria will not grow out fungus a next generation dna test that it will identify fungus very very quickly so for that patient who is having persistent symptoms especially really clear symptoms of infection like fever having a next generation dna urine test is, is an easy way to rule that in or rule that out um, and so Microgen DX has several DNA urine tests that you can order for a man and for a woman. They also do next-gen DNA testing on vaginal fluid, all sorts of things. And they have saved lives. The hard part is interpreting the data. Most doctors do not like next-generation tests because they have not taken the courses that will teach them how to interpret the data. Urine is not sterile. Urine has a lot of good beneficial bacteria in it. And so a next generation test is not going to be negative. It's going to, be, it's going to show bacteria because you want good bacteria in there. The question is, does it find pathogenic bacteria in there at high quantity? And so she's got nothing to lose. It's data. It's facts. If she thinks she's got infection and the doctors don't, she can order a next generation test herself. You just go to microgendx.com. Make sure you tell them you heard it from the IC network. We're not working with them at this point in time. They are, um, some, of the, some of the staff that I work with have moved on. Um, they've gone in a bit of a different direction, which is fine, but I'm still gonna refer patients to them because I believe in next generation testing. I believe that you deserve answers and I'm not gonna attach any emotionality to next gen testing as some people do. It's just data, it's just facts. It's $220 or $240 well spent in my opinion. Because for that patient who believes they have infection over and over and over again, if it comes back negative, honey, you do not have an infection for sure. And we've gotta move on. She has a healthy bladder wall. We have to follow the data. If she's got a healthy bladder wall and next generation testing comes back negative, then we got to start looking at muscles and nerves as the underlying cause of her symptom. We've got to look at IC phenotypes three, four, and five. Lori says, is there a medication for an estrogen flare and the burn? Topical estrogen, honey. You take one milligram estrogen uh, you had, since you've had your hysterectomy. So um, it's important to have your doctor look at the skin down there 
uh, it might be that you might need to use it a little bit more frequently. We have to, you know, for those of us who are a wee bit older, we have to be on top of the quality and health of our skin. And so it's important to have somebody to look at your skin to see if the estrogen you're using is enough. It might not be. Lori says that bending over will last a while. Be careful. Oh, I'm, I'm learning that. I swept my fluorids and vacuumed yesterday, and I'm paying for it today. Um... Another thing you can do for an estrogen burn, if you're having burning on the outside, is, is to make sure, you have to make sure that, that your skin is moist. And it's not water moist, it's oil moist. So a product that you can look at is vulva balm. Hold on. Oh boy. Tender, tender, tender. Vulva bomb. This is also known as V Magic, made by a company called uh, Medicine Mama. So, Vulva bomb is cool. It's very popular, one of our biggest sellers in the IC Network shop. It is as close to the natural consistency of normal mucus down there as I've ever seen. So you can see it, it's slightly, I mean, it's lighter than Vaseline by far. You know, it has a very light kind of botanical fragrance, but there's no perfumes in it or anything like that. It's just like more actually smells like very, very, very light olive oil, which makes sense since olive oil is a major base. And it has the perfect consistency. So for the days when you're not using your estrogen cream, or even if you are using something like this on the vulva on the outside several times a day can be very, very helpful. Uh, Mary said, does estrogen cream burn? So that this is a, a really, sorry guys, I just have to squirm. You just have to bear with me trying to get comfortable here. Um, stop it. <laughs> Doesn't like me moving that much. Okay. Um, for some women who start using topical estrogen cream, it burns when you first start using it. And they go, well, hell, I'm not going to use this. I'm not, it burned. I'm, why would I use that? That burning is a direct reflection of the quality and health of their skin. And you have to, you have to ride through the burn for about 10 days. The burning will go away. Every time you use the estrogen, your skin plumps up. It produces mucus. So that burning is going to get better and better and better, and then it will go away. But you have to ride through that burn for a good week or two until you feel better. If the burning persists after that, sometimes it's an ingredient in the formula. Like there are some brand names like Premarin, which are known for causing more burning because they have preservatives in them, and the preservatives might be a little bit irritating. So I get my estrogen cream preservative free from the Women's International Pharmacy. And yes, it burned for about 10 days. The burning is gone now. If I don't use it for about two weeks, I start feeling that little bit of heat again that tells me that, tells me that I need to use it. Diane says, an overactive bladder medication made her constipated. I'm off that med now. I'm using squatty potty and breathing exercises to release my pelvic floor and not strain now. I'm taking a stool softener with more water. Yeah, I used some Miralax after my surgery. I was really quite delighted with the results. 
one thing they don't tell you after you have gallbladder surgery and any surgery like this is that you can't you can't push <laughs> like after a hysterectomy you know they didn't warn me that that having a bowel movement after a hysterectomy is is difficult because you literally you can't push it out you you can't everything is everything is very tender and that was very very true with this too and i wanted to do a happy dance five days afterwards when i when i had a completely normal bowel movement you know because first couple of days were not fun ayama said i feel very a pain in my vagina and rectus rectal area pain when i fill with urine I feel relief after urination. I can't sit, can't sleep. So Yamo, how old are you, hun? How old are you? The fact that you can't sit down points me to muscles and nerves. Um, the fact that the pain in the vagina and, and the anus Again, we're looking at very sensitive nerves. Maybe we're looking at very, very tight pelvic floor muscles or we're looking at estrogen atrophy. So number one, how old are you? And number two, when your symptoms are really, really, really that severe, sometimes that implies that your bladder is being irritated on a daily basis by something. You're 54 years old. How old were you when your symptoms began? Is this new or did they begin a year ago, two years ago, 20 years ago? When did your symptoms first begin? Uh, Mary says, can you use coconut oil internally? I do not believe you should because um, coconut oil has the potential of being contaminated. I would make sure that you get an organic Evo uh, coconut oil rather than a really cheap oil. But I don't know any of these companies who would say that you can use them internally. There are a couple of internal vas uh, vaginal moisturizers, like there's one from a company called Luvina that you might be able to use. So Yamo on YouTube, how old were you when your symptoms began? Is this new or have you had symptoms for some time? Mary says, doctors are allowing people to suffer saying cultures are, are, are a gold standard. This seems to be only in the U.S. that next generation testing is acknowledged. You know, um, Mary, you're right. Um, and this is why we, the patient, have to be very aggressive, very informed. We cannot accept that there is that there is something not wrong with us when we are up all night and we have to pee every five or 10 minutes. If your symptoms are persisting, we always have to go back and say, why am I continuing to have symptoms? What have we missed? And if you absolutely believe you have infection, you can order a next generation DNA urine test and that will prove it once and for all. It was the, it was the editorial in my magazine Let's fall. If there are some people, there are some patients who just completely believe they have infection. No matter, they will only take antibiotics. They're not interested in anything else. And I was working with a patient who said that. I, she said, all I want is antibiotics. Don't give me anything else. This has to be a UTI. I'm sure this is a UTI. But antibiotics never worked for her. And her cultures were negative. She said, I don't care. It has to be an infection. Give me antibiotics. And I said, listen, you have to prove it now. There's one way to prove it, a next generation test. If your test comes back positive, you got all the ammunition you need to, ask to get the care you need. But if your next generation test comes back negative and it finds nothing unusual, then you have to accept at this point in time that it is not coming from your bladder, that you have a healthy bladder. And remember, the vast majority of IC patients, we all have healthy bladders. And that's where it gets confusing because we are having all the urinary symptoms that suggest it's the bladder. We have urinary symptoms that suggest it's a UTI. But you got to understand that tight pelvic floor muscles will cause all of those symptoms. Central sensitization will cause bladder wall sensitivity. 
So we have to follow the data. If you have a healthy bladder on cystoscopy and your culture is negative, then you've got, this is good news. You've got a healthy bladder. Now we got to look beyond the bladder, try to figure out what the problem is. Do you have a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder? Do you have endometriosis attached to your bladder? Do we have a Tarlov cyst at L4, L5 that's pushing on the nerves of the bladder? There are so many other conditions that can victimize the bladder and give you these symptoms. And that's what we have to look at next. And again, for me, now you've got to remember, I had frequency urgency in junior high. I couldn't sit through class. They told me I had infection. I still remember having to swallow 16 pills of sulfa in one sitting at the doctor's office. They gave me a massive shot of an of antibiotic. And then they dilated my urethra over and over and over and over and over and over again. Not fun for a teenager. 30 years I did it all. 30 years I still had flares. I never got better. And then the pelvic floor research came out. I went and had a pelvic floor assessment. She goes, wow, you got tight pelvic floor muscles on your left side. Okay, I accept that. Didn't do anything about it because we really didn't have pelvic floor therapists back then. But I was finally able to go to pelvic floor physical therapy and something remarkable happened. The great majority of my symptoms went away. Fascinating. Okay, so Yama, who's 50 years old today, her symptoms started uh, in 2014, 10 years ago when she was 44 years old. Um, her pain, her bladder pain started in 2021. So, so Yamo, is there any event that you associate with your, the onset of your symptoms? What happened in 2014? Is there any trauma? Do you remember any falls, car accidents? Did you have a hysterectomy? Anything at all like that happened in 2014? Uh, Donna says, is a stool softener or Miralax better? Miralax is so easy to use and gentle, whereas some stool softeners can be, like Dolcolax, can be pretty aggressive. I think it's just about finding what works for you, Donna. Try them both, see which one you like more. For me, my go-to, honestly, is eating a big bowl of green peas every other day. Um, Val says, I think I have all four types of IC. I have pain when sitting. I barely eat anything. I feel inflammation all the way to my thigh, all the way up to my thigh, and my pain gets worse as worse. Val, have you had a pelvic floor assessment, hon? And if you have, what'd they find? Are your muscles tight? Sue says, Jill just came on. What's going on with why you are walking funny? Sue, I had emergency surgery a week ago. My gallbladder decided it was no longer content to live in my belly and it raged war. It started throwing gallstones at me. And I was in a um, meeting a week ago last Thursday. And at the end of the meeting, I started having what I thought was a really bad stomach ache. Left fairly quickly, got myself home. By the time I got home, I was not walking. I was bent over. And the pain was radiating through my back. It was terrible. And uh, I called 911. I thought it was a blood clot from COVID in my heart, to be quite honest, or in my lung. Because uh, the pain was just pulsing. Just like right through my rib cage, through both breasts, and through the middle of my shoulder blades. Um, but at the emergency room, they did a sonogram and they saw that I, they were so impressed with my gallbladder, they kept wanting to show me pictures. It was full of giant stones. And so I had surgery, I had five incisions That's the worst one. That's the one where they took the stones out. And then there's an incision here, and then there's an incision here, and then there's an incision here. And there's an incision over here, too.
Sue says, I've been doing Tai Chi at senior neighbors close to my home. It's twice a week and it feels free. Amazing, especially if you have other pain issues. Oh, I would love to find a Tai Chi class just to me. That sounds so good. Mary said, estrogen cream burned so badly. It made my bladder crazy. I couldn't do it. Mary. Estrogen is essential to the health of your body, to the health of your bladder, to the health of your vulva. The fact that it burned badly shows that your skin is very, 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 very compromised. I have this conversation every day in my office with somebody. And so it becomes as no surprise that it burns so badly. That means your skin is extremely compromised and extremely dry. You gotta, you gotta get through that for like two weeks and the burning goes away. You can always ask for a compounded preservative-free estrogen cream too. But if you don't use the estrogen cream, you're just gonna get drier and it's just gonna get worse. And that's a problem. Tanya makes a very good point. Magnesium oxide can help with constipation. Very, very true and good for muscles. Anne says, can you get a flare from overactive bladder? Hell yeah. You drink coffee? Of course you're going to pee more. Mary says, even though I ordered it, my docs don't believe the results. I've had both negative and positive ones with the same symptoms. This is where the company experts can be very, very helpful. And so who treats you after next generation test if you need meds? My doctor has never heard of it. Well, generally your primary care or your urologist can pro provide the first level of care. But if, you, um, if you're struggling with infection after infection after infection and they're complex infections, you might need to be with an infectious disease specialist. So I was working with a patient a couple of months ago. Her symptoms started after a trip to Central America, like Panama or Costa Rica. And uh, she'd never had symptoms before. They started like a day or two before she came home. And they were really, really persistently bad and getting worse. And um, I sent her to an, an infectious disease specialist because in all likelihood, she picked up, she was swimming in muddy brown, muddy water. Never do that. Never, ever, ever, ever do that. Brown, muddy water is not where you want to put your body because it is filled with God knows what. Lots of bacteria, lots of fungi, and probably a lot of sewage and a lot of pesticides. Um, and, uh, I, I, I haven't heard back from her, but I'm pretty convinced that she had a, a um, par a parasitic disease from swimming in that water. Mary says, I know my issue is estrogen atrophy causing irritation. Even using the e string for 10 months did nothing for the bladder and estrogen creams burned so bad. I'm stuck. So awful. So, so Mary, using the vulva balm, again, try to keep that skin as moist as you can. This could be very helpful. Um, you may be having a reaction to one of the chemicals in the, in the estrogen cream. So... Uh, you could try Vagifem, um, which is that little pill insert that goes in there. Or I would encourage you to use a compounding pharmacy and tell them that you're very, very sensitive. And generally what they will do is they will try lots of different samples. They will put it in a lot of different potential bases uh, to, until they find a base that your body tolerates. Okay, uh, Yama says, in 2013, 
you used an IUD and after that you didn't have your monthly period after the doctor, afterwards the doctor told you you're an IC patient. Um, uh, so Yamo, we should talk. Why don't you give me a phone call this week? If you go to the IC Network website, icnetwork.org, our phone number is right at the top of the page, 800-928-7496. Let's talk next week. And let's see if we can, I'll try to phenotype you over the phone. There's a lot of questions that I would want to ask you to try to help figure out what the underlying cause is. It may be that the IUD put you into menopause. It gave you, that the IUD basically is too strong. You, and you, were, you did it in your 40s. So in your 40s, you're already perimenopausal. Using the ID, IUD might have put you in a full menopause, which dried your bladder out, which created um, the symptoms that you're struggling with now. And the fact that your symptoms have gotten worse in the last year, that also doesn't come as more surprise. But I would want to know, uh, there are a lot more questions that I would want to ask you to try to help you figure out what could be the underlying cause. So please give me a phone call, okay? I'd love to talk with you. You got bear with me. Facebook always goes ups and down, and I have to scroll through the results, scroll through them, find out where I am. Ow. Judy says, should you always have a urine culture if you think you have a UTI? The regular urinalysis comes back fine. Sure. A dipstick test. So basically, they start with a dipstick. So a dipstick will look for leukocytes and will look for nitrite. If you have a double positive, positive nitrite, positive leukocyte, you absolutely have some type of infection because the human body does not produce nitrites, but bacteria do. So they will always send out for a urine culture if you are double positive on a dipstick. If you are consistently positive for leukocytes, they will also always send that out to her. They should send that back to, out to you. But if your dipstick comes back negative on both, they might not. But you can ask for it. If you are persistently, believe, if you are persistently struggling, it's not unreasonable for the doctor to go up to the next level of testing. It's, but now let's just say now you've done the next level of testing. You've had culture after culture after culture. Guys, come on. I had to have probably had 20 cultures in my first two years with IC. I thought for sure it was infection. Yet they always came back negative. Always. I've only had, I think, two bladder infections in the last 30 years. That's it. And really, I don't even remember this. I know I had one for sure, but two, maybe. You know, be the squeaky wheel here. You can be the squeaky wheel. I mean, you pay them. They don't pay you. You're the boss. If you want a urine culture, you can ask for a urine culture. Doc, I'd really like to do this. Just like you can ask for a next generation test too, but you can order it yourself. Lori says, my pain is on my right side and it feels like someone is squeezing as hard as they can. So Lori, anytime pain is to the left or right of center, we're always going to look beyond the bladder because the, the bladder is basically above your pubic bone. So if you have pain on the right side, we have to look at what structures are on the right side. We're gonna look at, they need to look at your ovary, uh, but uh, they wanna look at your appendix. Um, so if, so with an, with appendicitis and a friend of mine, believe it or not, a friend of mine had an emergency appendix removal at the same time that I had my emergency surgery too, which is crazy. Um, with an appendicitis, if you push in, it doesn't hurt, but when you release it, it hurts terribly. So if you're noting pain with palpation, you need to get your tush down to the emergency room. 
We don't want you to have a ruptured appendix. That would be terrible and could be life-threatening. Um, get yourself the urgent care or the emergency room if you're having really intense pain on your low right-hand side. But last but not least, we're going to look at your hip, SI joint, and your pelvic floor muscles on the right side. Sue says, holy, that's a lot of incisions. Holy cow. Prayers for a speedy recovery. Thank you, honey. It is. I was gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. Like literally, I thought I was dying of a COVID, of a COVID slot in my heart or my lungs. I just remember she said, well, I've talked to the surgeon. And I went, what? <laughs> Laying in the emergency room. Yeah, we're going to take it out. <laughs> what? And then it was just stunned acceptance. I didn't start crying until like four days later. Then I just lost it one night. I lost it one night with my sister. I'm just like, you have to, you have to let the stress out, you know? Bonnie said, gallbladder happened to me when I was 22, three weeks after my second C-section, three operations in 19 months. Girl, I feel, I feel you. Anne says, next generation can have you on antibiotics for a long time, causing more problems. Well, it depends on what they find, hon. In fact, next generation actually reduces the need for long-term antibiotics because the next generation test will actually identify drug resistance genes and it will exclude the, uh, the antibiotic that, you're, you're, that will not kill that infection. So used properly, next generation testing will actually minimize Reduce the use of antibiotics. Mary says, in the U.S., can you just refer yourself to ID even, even, or even a specialist? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depends on your health insurance. Tarnisha said, are hydro, are hydro distensions only done in the OR? They should only be done in the operating room. They are they do not suggest that they'd be done in the doctor's office because when you stretch the bladder, that causes severe pain. In the old days, they used to do it in the, in the doctor's office. And patients would be screaming like a lunatic as they stretch the bladder. Today, our national guidelines say that it should be done as an outpatient procedure uh, with proper anesthesia so the patient is not suffering. Anne said, it's vulva bomb better than nothing. Afraid. Uh, vulva bomb is excellent, uh, but it's not going to do what topical estrogen will do. Topical estrogen is basically food. It's food for the cells. It helps them for, to produce mucus. Why are you afraid of topical estrogen? I don't. I don't understand why. It's it's the most natural thing you can do. Mary said, "Could it be the actual estrogen that's a problem? Because I've tried many compounds and they all burn me. I'm just baffled." as to why E-string didn't help if atrophy is the issue. Mary, I guess the other thing that comes to mind is perhaps you have very, very severe neuroinflammation throughout your pelvis. Your nerves are just, they have become very, 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 very sensitive. I wonder if they can combine the estrogen with some lidocaine cream. Jenny said, my urgency in burning is worse after urinating. Which subtype is that? That's going to be pelvic floor. It could be estrogen atrophy if, the, if your skin is burning or pelvic floor. And Nancy says, what are my thoughts on pellets? Pellets are uh, things that they, uh, little, uh, uh, there's two different ways of doing it. I mean, pellets come in different therapies. There are some pellets that are used for radiation therapy, so you're not talking about that, right? Are you talking about the estrogen pellets that they can put under the skin? I, I do not know to what degree that estrogen is going to get to where you need it the most. Systemic estrogen therapy, estrogen therapy that you swallow that gets absorbed into the bloodstream is associated with a greater risk of cancer because it's going everywhere. Now, what the research shows is that if you're under the age of 60, uh, and you're struggling with significant perimenopause or menopausal symptoms, they suggest the use of systemic estrogen therapy. But once you're over the age of 60, there's a greater risk of other things happening. 
So systemic therapy, where you're swallowing it or perhaps implanting it under the skin, has a great potentially has a greater risk of cancer. Whereas topical estrogen therapy, which you put directly on the skin, the estrogen stays in that area, and that the research shows that there's no greater risk of cancer, especially the risk in the last five years. But oh, you know, there's a lot of misinformation going on about the risk of cancer therapy because of one article that was published 20 years ago in which they grossly misinterpreted the data. And the New York Times did a fabulous article last spring that really helped us understand why this misinformation and unnecessary fear happened with the use of some estrogens. Um, the research in the last 10 years, five to 10 years, has shows that Topical estrogen therapy is, is considered very safe, very effective, and they're worried for those women who are really suffering with something driven by estrogen loss that can be treated so easily. They feel that millions of women are suffering unnecessarily. I can tell you for me, if I don't use my topical estrogen, my urethra burns. I have about a two-week window. And then as I start to feel like there's a, a drop of urine stuck in my urethra that won't come out. My urethra becomes more and more inflamed. The urethra is the canary in the coal mine of the urinary tract when it comes to estrogen atrophy. It's the first part of the urinary tract that starts to scream, hey, I'm getting dry down here. That happened to me when I was 51 or 52. And, you know, listen, my IC self-help skills are excellent. I know what I'm doing here. And for three months. I did everything I could to deal with this new urethral pain. Nothing worked. Threw myself on the mercy of my urologist. I'm laying on the ta exam table in syrup. She takes one look at me down there and he goes, Jill, ow. <laughs> and I went, yes. And, and he said, um, aren't you using the estrogen that I prescribed for you last year? And I went, no. And he said, why? And I said, because in my brain, I'm 25 years old and I can't possibly have an age related issue. <laughs> and he said, um, yeah, I was trying to stop that from happening because I saw this happening last year. And then he explained to me that the urethra is the canary in the coal mine. It's the first part of the urinary tract to start screaming. So he, he prescribed the estrogen again and he had me rub a pea-sized drop of estrogen right into the entrance of my urethra. And you know what? It works. It, and I've been doing it consistently ever since. But if I forget to do it, as I am known to do every now and then, within about two to three weeks, the urethra irritation comes back. Or more importantly, when I put the, the cream on, it starts to feel hot again. And that tells me I'm not using it enough. Chloe says, when do I think the UTI vaccine will be available in the United States? I don't know, but hopefully it'll be announced next month at the American Urology Association meeting. I, we need this, baby. This is going to be a game changer. To be, able, to be able to have a vaccine that will prevent E. coli bladder infections, you understand how massive that is? That is massive. It will be so good for medical care. Uh, there are millions and millions and millions of men and women who struggle with, who have struggled with infection over the years. And especially that postmenopausal woman who's struggling with recurring UTI. It's going to a total game changer. Very, very exciting. Sue so said, I've only had uh, two UTIs in 40 years since having symptoms, but I get too bad of a flare. But if I get too bad of a flare, I don't ignore them. I still go to the lab. If you have a good doctor, they'll call it in for you because the two times I didn't go, I ended up with a kidney infection and ended up on IV antibiotics. So if something feels different, don't ignore it, ladies. Excellent advice, Sue. Nancy said, Farziga turned out to be my problem. I've been off of it for six weeks and the pain is gone. Yes. Just thought I'd let you know since I bounced around on this page quite a bit. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Mary said, also, my cultures come back under threshold, so they throw it out. Last week just went through this. Happens a lot, and they tell me it's negative, but my dipstick lit up crazy, so I knew. I know, honey. 
Bonnie said, I found out I have another hernia in the pelvic area from the hysterectomy. Girl! You know, um, hernias are a beast. So basically, a hernia means that the tissue which normally keeps or the muscle that normally keeps your organs in place has been damaged or is split open and things like bowel slide through the hole. And, and then it squeezes, it's bad. So you can have her, an umbilical hernia up by your belly button, you can have an inguinal hernia uh, down, down lower, or you can have a belly, uh, you can have a esophageal, is that what they call it? The hernia up at the top of the stomach. The good news, Bonnie, is they found it. So get it fixed. Get it fixed. Uh, Tarnisha said, can your urethra become inflamed when you're constipated? It's very common, common, common to have increased bladder urinary symptoms when you're, when you're struggling with constipation. Number one, it may be that the muscles are tight. Number two, um, you get you get what we call packing. I mean, guys, listen, we're all adults here. We can talk about anything. I have no shame. Packing means that you've got a lot of stool collected in your rectum that's not coming out, and it starts to bulge and push against things. Um, and so. Uh, I can remember my first year with IC. What what happened to me my first year? How did I say this to my doctor? What I okay. What I said first is that I had, and this is so interesting. Back then, so this was when I was thirty two and thirty three. I would get intense perineal pain, which is that skin between the vagina and the rectum. And then I would get like vaginal discomfort. Then I would get vulvar discomfort. Then I would get urethral discomfort over like a period of three days. And then finally it would hit my bladder. And that was really consistent the first couple of years. I mean, and I finally, I went to Dr. Klein and I was like, what? is this this is this is what happens every single time every single time and he's like i don't know jill okay but 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 now we know that that's probably a progression of muscle tension or neurosensitivity i'm getting close to pain medicine i'm getting close to needing pain medicine guys just fair warning I'm probably at a, I started the meeting at a four. I'm probably at a six now. So we'll see how long I last. I did too much yesterday. Arr, so frustrating. It's like my, it's like my belly is being held together by staples, but there's no staples. They did glue, but it's just like, everything's just, really tight and moving is not fun. Okay. Sue says my mom's cancer came endometrial cancer came back. Oh honey. I'm so sorry. Girl, you guys have been through it. They've had, so they have her for the next uh, four months on an anti-hormone therapy, anti-estrogen therapy, which has made her bladder uh, she's made her incontinent, very painful. You have an appointment coming up with the urogynecologist in town that I trust. What should I be asking him? By the way, when she was in the hospital, they used a device that I actually see on TV. That's an external catheter. Yeah, that's cool. Cause my mom had a UTI that went septic and allowed her to sleep all night with that. Yeah, they, they did that for my mom too. So basically, it's a catheter that you you basically stick between your legs, like right up against your vulva, and it will drain any urine you leak out. Super, super great option for people struggling, for women struggling with leakage at night. 
for men, men have a condom catheter, which is the bomb. We unfortunately can't use something like that. So this new absorbent catheter is fantastic. So what should you be asking him? Has she had a hysterectomy too? I mean, if it came back, she's already had the hysterectomy, right? So where is the cancer now? And I'm really sorry that you guys are going through that, honey. I'm so sorry. Paula says, I think I was stuck on fight or flight and I was in so many groups where everybody was so much. I started only following the IC network and reading Dr. Cerna plus keeping my estrogen cream. Every day gets better. I wonder if I still need to take fesoteridine every day or maybe I can reduce that to every other day. Well, I think that sounds like a really, really good question for your doctor. Um, I was working with another patient who was just so overwhelmed by what she was reading on Facebook and Reddit. It was just making her so scared. And I said, get off of social media. Come watch our support group meetings. Because what you read online, it's irrelevant at this point in time because we all have phenotypes. So if somebody might be telling a, 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 a very scary story of their pain because they have hundreds of lesions while others, you know, but you don't have hundreds of lesions. So what they're saying is pointless to you. That's a fundamental, that's the fundamental flaw with online support groups right now is that you can't put apples, oranges, and bananas in the same room and expect them to be able to share experiences because they don't. And the newly diagnosed patient gets scared by the veteran patient who's struggling. So we've got a, a young newly diagnosed patient whose symptoms began after having a baby, if they have a pelvic injury, you put that in the same group with a woman who's got severe hunter, hunter's lesions because she's got an active viral infection. That girl's gonna be scared, is that gonna happen to me? And the answer of course is no, you're completely different. She's got a virus. You've got an injury. Don't worry about that. Mary says, how did Vagifem work for the urethra? Do you need the cream as well? That's the thing. Is Vagifem is not going to get to the urethra perhaps in as much as you might want, which is why the cream is preferable. Marlia says, how often do you use estrogen cream? Your, your frequency of use is determined by your doctor, depending upon what your skin looks like. Right now, I'm using mine two to three times a week. Some people use it every day for a month or so, and then they back off. Some use it once a week. If that's, I cannot give you dosage advice like that. That's up to the doctor looking at your skin to see where you are. Sam says, hi, Jill, is your dynamics worth it? You've been suffering from horrible frequency for over a year, started estrogen, got a bit better, but not, but it's not gone. Eurodynamics is not a diagnostic test that's particularly meaningful when it comes to IC. What a urodynamics test does is it tells us the health of your nerves and are your nerves functioning normally. I had a urodynamics test. It's not that big of a deal. It's not the funnest thing in the world. Basically, you're laying on a table in your doctor's office, you have a catheter, what they're going to do is slowly fill your bladder with fluid and they're going to ask you, when do you first feel the need to urinate? They're going to ask you, when does it hurt? And they might push it a little bit farther than that and then they stop and it's done. All they're doing basically is testing basic bladder capacity and the nerves that communicate that bladder capacity to your brain. Are they normal? Um, what's far more useful than a urodynamics is a pelvic floor exam. So before having an invasive test like a urodynamics, I would make sure that I've had a proper pelvic floor assessment first. And let's see if your pelvic floor is normal or not. Maybe it's not. Don said, the estrogen causes me more pain. Nurse practitioner has me trying hyaluronic acid. Um, uh, so, Don, again, sometimes it's the formulation. Does it have preservatives in it as compared to preservative free? Uh, the pharmacy that I use is the Women's International Pharmacy. They're a mail order pharmacy in Arizona. They're sweet to work with. It would be, and I, they don't pay me to say that. It was my surgeon, Dr. Bennett, my gynecologist, who 
who basically said, Jill, we already know you're super sensitive. We're not going to waste time with anything else. I'm sending you to the best. A preservative-free formula. And even though it's the best, it's also very, very inexpensive. It, I think it's now, when I started doing it, it was like 40 for three months. Now I think the price is 75 for three months, but it's still, I've never burnt, I've never had an issue with it that was not related to just me not being consistent with it. Jenny says, I do have a tight pelvic floor, but also food sensitivity. Can pelvic floor dysfunction cause issues with food? Well, girl, do I have the article for you. And actually, Jenny, this is a blog on the IT Network website that I actually put on, I put in our magazine too. Question of the day, why am I diet sensitive if my pelvic floor problem if pelvic floor muscles are the problem. So let me just read that to you. We get this question every week. If you've had symptoms for years and bladder therapies aren't working and you're still struggling with flare, it's just time to look beyond the bladder and specifically to your pelvic floor muscles. Did you suffer an injury before your symptoms began? Were you an athlete? Did you ride bikes, motorcycles, horses? Were you a gymnast or a skater? Did you fall onto your pelvis or your tailbone? Have you had pelvic surgery. Injured traumatized muscles often become weakened and then tight, literally squeezing blood vessels. This then leads to pelvic ischemia, aka poor circulation and blood supply. Thus, if the bladder only gets half the expected blood flow, will the bladder wall be healthy? The answer, of course, is no. For many of these patients, years of bladder treatments are ineffective. They continue to struggle with symptoms of flares. Why? Because bladder treatments will not fix the underlying problem, poor blood supply. The goal of physical therapy is to relax and release muscle tension to support better circulation. That's when healing occurs. Yes, diet modification is important to keep your symptoms minimal, but once your muscles improve, you may be able to enjoy many more foods. In general, the patients who are the most diet sensitive are those with Hunter's lesions or estrogen atrophy. Okay, so so in other words, there's a toll to having tight muscles over time. You enter a state of ischemia. Ischemia means that we have oxygen deprivation and nutritional deprivation. The tissue is not healthy if it is being starved for oxygen or food. So will the bladder wall be healthy in somebody with severely tight muscles? It will not. Will that patient have food sensitivity? Absolutely. But once we restore blood supply and we get the bladder, the, the nutrition it needs to heal, the bladder heals and you're probably not going to be as food sensitive. Now, I mean, again, my subtype is, or phenotype is tight pelvic floor muscles on my left side and central sensitization. 30 years ago, I was as food sensitive as any of you. Cranberry juice, tomato, lemon, lime, you name it. I can remember, I can remember I bought a lime drink and it just destroyed me. Oh my God. Or having a couple of sips of champagne 30 years ago destroyed me. And yet my bladder wall was healthy. You look at my bladder, I, had a I have a baby bladder. Nothing physically wrong with my bladder. So I followed the IC diet literally up until last year. Because I don't want to be in pain. The pain was terrible. I didn't want to be in pain. Well, I got COVID last May. As my, we all got it at the hospital while we were with my parents as they died. And my last moment with my mom um, alive was me for five minutes before I started coughing so violently. I was gagging and I couldn't breathe. So I ran out of the hospital to my car, drove home and was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And my brain went hot lemonade with honey. So I drove home coughing like a beast. Or I stopped at the store. I was wearing a mask, bought lemonade, bought honey. I was shocked that I didn't flare. Shocked. I've been drinking lemonade every day since then. It's now 10 months later. 
Why? Why am I no longer food sensitive? Because my pelvic floor muscles are no longer tight. My nerves are calmed down. I can eat anything now. I can eat anything now. I was stunned. I was stunned. So I am living proof that once we calm, we restore a blood supply and we calm those nerves down, things get better. Don said, you tried a cream in a compounded one because it caused me pain too. That's when I started having pain. You, you've been on birth control starting in 87. Well, don't give up, Don, because there are a lot of bases that they can use. They can use coconut oil. They can use olive oil. They can use various creams. So that's when you go back to the compounding pharmacy and say, can you give me some samples of bases? And sometimes they will give you a little tiny tub that you can try to see if you're having a reaction to the base. I mean, some of it, I, I know it's exhausting and I know it's frustrating and you just want to find the damn thing that that's me and blood pressure medication right now. It's just like the, the first blood pressure medication basically did nothing for a year. The second one was perfect until it turned my freaking thyroid off. And the third one um, raised my liver enzyme levels. And I'm just like, oh, you know what, God? It is what it is. The good news is in the middle of my emergency, my um, almost 24-hour stay in the emergency room, my blood pressure was consistently 131 over 85. And so I can live with that. Cindy said, I started having issues after an MRI, CAT scans, checking for numbing in my legs. I was prescribed back physical therapy and CPAP for sleep apnea. Following this, I developed constant burning, diagnosed with UTI, even with negative urine tests, unsuccessful results. For four months in pain, February col a col a col a colonoscopy was negative, good. Sent, for sent to a urologist, CT is negative. Cisto came back irritated, but no cancer, diagnosed with IC, medications are unsuccessful due to allergic reactions. So azo is my only relief and it caused an upset stomach. Okay, but Cindy, you say something here that's really, really important here. You started having issues as they were checking for numbing in your leg. So the fact that you had numbness in your leg shows that you've got a compression or you've got a ruptured disc that's compressing a nerve at L4, L5. So that also affects the bladder area. So what if they, or you could have a Tarlov cyst coming off of your spinal cord that's also pushing on that nerve root that's going to your bladder. So what have they done for that? Is the physical therapy working for that and has the numbness gone away? And also, do you know what a dermatome is? A dermatome. Let me, uh, here, hold on a sec. Let me. Oh, you know, I had, let me print one out and I want to show it to you. Here, hold on a sec. Let me find a good one here. Give me one quick sec. Let me just print this out. I want to show it to you. Uh, you know, I swear I had one up already printed out. Hold on. Okay, it's not there. Sorry guys, I just have to adjust everything to be comfortable. And as you can see, I'm losing weight like a beast right now because I, I didn't eat for like five days. Okay, so hold on. I just wanna find, give me, give me a quick moment because this is important. This is really, really important for everybody.
Okay, that's a good picture right there. That's an even better picture. Are they gonna let me print this out? No. Darn it, darn it, darn it. Ooh, that's a good picture. That's a good picture. I want to find a good picture. Ooh, National, ow. National Institutes of Health picture. Just have to be big enough. All right, let me see if I can print this out. If anybody needs to go use the bathroom, this is a good opportunity. I'm just going to be a minute. I really want to print this out because I really want you to understand the role that compressed nerves can play in all of this. I just have to. Okay. Close that. New document. A blank document. Okay. Let me grab this picture from my desktop. And we're going to put that right here. Yeah, baby. There we go. Looking good. This is going to be a good picture. Okay, hold on, let's print it out. Printer's on. Excellent. Oh, yeah, great picture. Okay, this is a great picture. This is going to work. So a dermatome is basically a map of the nerves as they come out of the spinal cord from your disc. And so... The nerves at the upper part of your back are going to be involved in your arms. The nerves in the lower part of your back are going to be damp involved in your pelvis and in your leg. So here is a great picture of the dermatome. So you can see up here, C6, C7, C8. If you've got an injury here, you're going to feel it in your arm and in your hand. If you've got an injury in your lumbar region, L3, L4, L5, you're going to feel that in potentially in your leg going all the way down to your foot. So what's interesting for me is that I, during a fire evacuation, had to lift a 70-pound gun case to get my elderly father to evacuate. And I ruptured L4 and L5. And the way I felt it is that I feel it along the front of my leg, right above my knee. And then I also feel it right below my knee. So, so Cindy, as you think about the numbing in your legs, we want to use a dermatome map to map where the numbing is to where in your back you have a compressed nerve.
And what you can't see, when we think about the pelvic area, if you have um, pain by your rectum, by your tailbone, in your sacrum, you see these little circles here? So they've mapped where S5, S4, S3, you can see these little, these little um, outgoing circles, expanding circles. And if we come over to this side, pain at the very in top inside of your upper thigh gets mapped to S2. Isn't that interesting? So these are, let me write it down. Uh-oh, what did I do there? Dermatomes. Okay, dermatome. So again, another thing that can happen is it might not be at the spinal cord. You can also have compressed nerves from your pelvic floor in, inside your pelvic cavity. And that also is going to trigger the symptoms that you're struggling with, especially burning. Tight muscles burn. You remember when you were a kid and they made you go run around the track and you didn't want to? And of course, your legs started burning halfway around the track. Why? Because muscles that are working hard are muscles that build up lactic acid and lactic acid burns. So a burning pain is actually more associated with the pelvic floor. Um, bladder wall pain is very sharp and shrill. It feels like razor blades, a hunter's lesion. Pelvic floor pain tends to be duller, achier, and have a burning sensation. So, you know, I mean, the good news here is your testing, a lot of your testing is coming back good, but we know you've got a problem with muscles and nerves. Um, the, uh, your cysto came back as a bit irritated, but no cancers. The other thing we have to think about, Cindy, is just your age and estrogen atrophy. It may be that you've, you've just come to an age where your bladder can't defend itself as well anymore because your estrogen levels are dropping. We call that the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. That is not a disease. That's basically dryness in your urethra in your bladder. You know how you can get a dry mouth and that hurts? Well, you can have a dry urethra and dry bladder and that hurts and it will make you very sensitive to food. Sam says, hold on. Sorry, not sure if my message came through. Is a urodynamics worth it? Yeah, okay. You don't need a urodynamics for GSM. That's how your bladder, that's, that's how, I mean, you see that just by looking at the skin, looking in your vagina. Um, you know, if you want to give me a phone call this week, I'd be happy to talk to you for Sherry says, take your pain meds. When I take my pain meds, I shouldn't be doing a meeting. I probably have about a 30 minute window before I'd have to get off, but I'm getting very close to needing them. Uh, Leslie said, I got flares from walking in a store, sitting at my desk on two pillows, housework, or any physical activity. So that's not your bladder, honey. That's tight pelvic floor muscle. The bladder doesn't cause flares from walking or from sitting. Muscles and nerves do. Sue said her mom had a complete hysterectomy and it came back on the backside of her colon and, and if they would have removed it, she would have needed a colostomy bag and there would have been complications. They're trying to shrink it with hormone therapy. Yeah. Oh, honey. Give her a hug for me, okay? Okay. 
Ashley says, what does a pea-sized drop of estrogen cream do on the urethra do? It just introduces the estrogen exactly where you need it, right on that skin down there. Thaisa said, what's the best time to call me for a consultation? I got to the point where I have tried almost everything. Oh, I love working with patients with you, with, like you, hun. You think you've tried everything and nothing's worked? Call me. Um, but but Thaisa, you give a thing. You say you go to physical therapy once a week and it seems to help, but you're in pain the next day. I feel sometimes I have all four. My AC started 14 years ago, yada, yada, yada. Honey, the best time to call me is in the afternoons. Like afternoon, between 12 and 2 or th later than 3. Um, my staff leave at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because they start work early. And so generally, I answer most of the phones after 2 o'clock. And uh, the problem with that is then um, if I get stuck doing a coaching and somebody calls... To, to buy something in our store or check on an order. It gets really, really awkward. So call like up to up to up to two o'clock and the odds are you're gonna get me. Leave a message. Please know I call back. Sometimes I call back late because I'm in California. So five o'clock for me might be eight o'clock for you on the East Coast. But that's when I do my best work. So just call, and if I don't answer, just leave a message. I promise you I will call you back. And just know, again, I'm recovering from surgery, so I might be going a little slow. Mary said, you're so right about those groups and advice, but curious. How did they determine if you have a viral infection causing bladder issues? They say Epstein-Barr can cause it, but no docs recognize this or no testing. Not true. We actually have doctors internationally and I see that are using next generation testing to find that active infection and to treat it with an antiviral. Carol says, what did they do in a pelvic floor assessment? Super easy. Pelvic floor assessment is a second set of eyes on your pelvis. Your ability to describe your symptoms gives them a roadmap. And so before you go to that first appointment, it's very, I want you to really take a day or two and really think about your symptoms and write down the random ones. Do you ever have pain that shoots down your leg? Do you ever have, feel a buzzing sensation? Do you ever feel a vibration? Does your pain get worse in a certain position? Does it get better in the other? Do you have pain when you sit down? Does it get better when you stand up? Um, um, just, uh, try to think about what does it feel like? Is it sharp? Is it dull? What makes it better? What makes it worse? All that I just and we, over on the IT Network website, and I actually just filmed a video on this for our master class. We have a lot of questions that I want you to think about before that first appointment. Okay, so just wear yoga clothes, just wear your gym clothes, no big deal. When you get there, um. Uh, they should have you walk up and down a hallway. Let's see how you walk. They will measure the length of your legs. Do you have one leg longer than the other? I was working with a patient a couple weeks ago who had one leg two inches shorter than the other because she had polo as a, polio as a child. And that was why her muscles were so incredibly tight. Um, at the, and then once they do those basics, they will ask if they can do a vaginal exam. I hope you will say yes, because that's the single most important part of the exam. And what they're going to do, you're not in stirrups. You don't use a speculum, anything like that. Super, super easy. You're just laying on a table, regular physical therapy table with your knees up. They will gently insert their finger in your vagina. And let me get my model. I can show you. So they're going to stick their finger in your vagina. And all they're going to do is touch muscle groups. They're going to touch muscles on the left side. They're going to touch muscles on the right side. They're going to touch, they're going to feel the muscle tone. A healthy muscle feels like a raw, chi a raw chicken breast. It's got substance, but it's soft and pliable. A tight muscle feels like beef jerky and it's tender to touch. So that's what they're looking for. They're gonna go on the left side, they're gonna go on the right side, they're gonna go shallow, 
then they're going to go maybe mid-level and just touch different muscles, get a sense of the muscle health. And then they might go all the way up here to your piriformis muscles, right? All the way up here. Um, super, super easy. And if they touch a muscle and trigger pain, that is what I call your hallelujah moment. That is very, very exciting. But they found it. And listen, for some patients who were told that they had IC 20, 30 years ago, and they've done bladder therapies for years, and nothing's worked, and then they go to physical therapy, and they touch a muscle, and it hurts, it's like, holy hell, it's been my muscle all this time? What? What? <laughs> so if they can touch a muscle and trigger your pain, that's a very, very exciting. Your immediate question is, that's it, what are you touching? I want you to be able to walk out of that appointment with the name of the muscle. Is it your piriformis, your obturator, your levator, and I? They will normally give you some exercises that you can work, do, and depending upon what they find, they may ask for you to come back. For some patients, muscle tension has been there for their entire life. For some, for some women, some women have been in a state of vaginismus their entire life, all from an early injury in childhood. There are some women out there who've never had not pain-free sex. There are some women out there who, have, who haven't had a pelvic exam for 25 years because their muscles are so tight, literally trying to touch them hurts. But there's a toll to having tight muscles, and that is ischemia. It cuts down blood supply that affects your bladder wall and your nerves and your muscle. Your tissues are not going to be healthy if you're in a state of muscle tension. So physical therapy is the single most effective therapy that has been found to be helpful in double-blind placebo-controlled styles for uh, studies for IC. Physical therapy outperforms every other therapy out there. Why? Because for most of us, IC is neuromuscular. And when we heal those muscles, when we get those muscles to relax and release, symptoms improve dramatically. So please let them do the internal exam. It's not disgusting. And it's, as you can see, there's no other way to reach this muscle, to touch this muscle. There are some muscles, the only way you can reach them is through the vagina and through the rectum. This is not creepy. This is not sexual in any way. This is just touching these vital skeletal muscles called your pelvic floor muscles. These are the muscles to help you open and close your legs. These are the muscles to help you balance, all that sort of stuff. You can read a lot more about that over on the IC Network website also. Thank you, Sylvianne. Appreciate it, honey. Kelly says, my mom is 73 and has IC, and now they're telling her she has IBS too. She's extremely depressed because she's suffering so much. I don't feel like the doctors have ever, ever helped her with the IC over the years, but she's had it. I want to help her, but I, I don't know what to do. Kelly, it's going to start with phenotyping. If her symptoms began after the age of 50, she in all likely ha likelihood has a genitourinary syndrome of menopause. That's IC phenotype number two, estrogen atrophy. Um, if you want to give me a phone call this week, I'd be happy to talk to you. I'd be happy to talk to her, see if we can phenotype her and, and try to point in the right direction, okay? But I'll carry hope in your heart. For the great majority of women whose symptoms begin as they've gotten older, we know exactly what to do. And that is we have to improve the quality and health of the skin. So if you can, Google genital urinary syndrome of menopause or go to a uh, our website, bladderhealth.org, I just converted that over to a GSM website, bladderhealth.org, bladderhealth.org. That website's dedicated to patients just like your mom, and I think it, you might find it very helpful, but you're always welcome to give me a phone call. You're welcome to sign up for coaching if you want. I'd be happy to work with you both. Jeannie says, thank you. That makes sense as I've had IT for 25 years. The only trigger was sex. So that sex trigger is a pelvic floor trigger. Then after a second COVID vaccine, I flared so insanely and became food sensitive and I've been in a flare since. Some days better than others. Could the vaccine have flared the pelvic floor? Probably not. Or the nerves in the pelvic floor? Probably not. After the shot, my pet physical therapist said my muscles were guarding. That's more likely. 
that's far more likely. The muscles that lock down and get tight during episodes of intense stress and fear and fight or flight are going to be the pelvic floor muscles. Mary says, would Elmeron instills help for atrophy? Yes, I know about the eye. It, would, it wouldn't fix anything. It would be a temporary Band-Aid. Uh, but so would a uh, chondroitin installation, an ileral in installation if you're in Canada or Europe or here in the United States, a rescue installation with heparin and lidocaine. Or, Mary, you could go to the chondroitin-based supplements like Bladder Builder that would, or Systomen, that would help too, potentially. Worth trying, at least. Cindy said, last week your CT showed a sacral region or bone island at five millimeter. Interesting. Tanisha says, I know for me running bothers my pelvic floor or bladder as well. Thank you for doing these talks. It's so helpful. Tanisha, you'd be amazed to know that many elite female runners, even them, the, even Olympic athletes in their 20s, actually the pelvic floor muscles have been so badly traumatized by their running that they have to run with pessaries. So running, it doesn't surprise me all that running bothers you. Lori said, why does sex cause a flare? Because at the moment of orgasm, you have an intense pelvic floor spasm. So for a man with pelvic pain, their worst pain is the moment they ejaculate. For a woman, our flare usually begins four to six hours afterwards when the pelvic floor muscles gently contract for about 24 hours to help sperm meat egg. Classic, classic. Leslie said, I'm having a complete hysterectomy on Wednesday. Girl, Dr. Jessica Hahn is doing it in Salt Lake City. I'm nervous about the effect it will have on my bladder. Okay, so um, do we know? So, so Jessica, that's exactly the same question I had seven years ago when I had my hysterectomy. And in fact, it was the first time I emailed the top doctors in the country and ask them for personal advice because I didn't want the hysterectomy to set me back into the pain that I experienced my first couple of years. And every single one of them said, um, they just, it's very, very rare, especially with the new technique. So I had a laparoscopic assisted total vaginal hysterectomy. So what that means is that they make incisions on your belly, like at your belly button, up, above your pubic bone and the one-to-one -one side. And they use, uh, uh, lapar uh, they use instruments like a laparoscope that they put through those little incisions to visualize the area. And that's where they do the cutting. So what they're going to do, if they do it that way, is they will kind of explore the area, make sure they see where all the attachment points are, and then they start cutting the attachment points. And then essentially, they make an incision directly below your cervix, and they pull it all out in one piece. Fascinating. I will tell you that it did not bother my bladder at all. I also had a hydro distension when they were done to make sure they didn't accidentally cut my bladder. That's Po it's always possible. Um, uh, my bladder was perfectly fine afterwards. Uh, recovering from hysterectomy is rough um, because you're going to be you're going to be walking like I'm walking right now, except you're going to have you're going to walk here. <laughs> so I had a laparoscopy up here a week ago for my gallbladder. <laughs> so yours, your incisions are gonna be lower. Um, recovering from a hysterectomy is, um, uh, takes a lot of time. You can't lift anything. There are going to be multiple layers of, in, of sutures inside of your body. And basically, there are some sutures that are holding your viscera together, which is what I have right now. And um, uh, they are not, they do not uh, dissolve rapidly. They're, they're, they're going to be stitches holding things together for like 90 days. 
And so the reason why you don't want to lift anything is if you bend over and pick something up, you're going to tear it. You're going to tear a, uh, a stitch, which is what I did at week six, bending over and picking up a T-shirt. So there's a fabulous website called Hister Sisters, HisterSisters.com. They were started when I got started with the IC Network. They're fabulous. They're, went, they're, where, they're where I went for my support for my hysterectomy. They've got all these checklists on things to do before. Um, you're not going to be able to go back to work quickly. Some people will say you will. I'm telling you right now, six weeks, eight weeks eight weeks more likely. Uh, I didn't drive in, until maybe 20 days later. Uh, you're going to need help doing laundry. Uh, you can't lift stuff. You can't lift your shopping bags. But, you know, I'm fine now. Um, I needed pelvic floor therapy afterwards because my pelvic floor muscles were not happy with the entire experience. And so I, uh, about mm, two months afterwards, I felt a pulling sensation when I sat down and that was uh, my levator anti muscles. And so I eventually, the last piece of my recovery was getting back to pelvic floor physical therapy and having them work on those muscles to get those muscles to relax and release after the surgery. Um, so laparoscopic assisted total vaginal hysterectomy. I've got a video on our website, uh, I'm on this YouTube channel or on my YouTube channel about my experience. Um, I don't regret it. It saved my life. Um, I wish I'd known a little bit more about it. Um, one of the things that my doctor didn't tell me is that you're, you literally for the first two weeks are not going to be able to push to have to push out a bowel movement. Uh, you just won't be able to. You, you just take my word for it. So um, they didn't tell me to use stool softeners. And so like on day five post, I had to do an enema to get things out. Um, so go over to History Sisters and check out their resources. They've got great tips. You got this, girl. You got this. I got through it. Many, many millions of women have gotten through it. It's just not, I wasn't afraid of it. I was more shocked that I needed it in the first place. I was more shocked by a uterine cancer diagnosis. I was willing to do anything to save my life. I, I do not regret it at all. It just takes time. Also, the other thing I think that's very, very important is that uh, you're going to need pain meds for the first week, for sure, like an opiate, like Norco. Um, and that was something that I made very, very clear with my, my surgeon, um, is that I will not do this without a prescription for a Vicodin in my hand before the appointment. I want to fill it. I want to have it at home when I get home. That's the other thing is hysterectomies are often now outpatient procedures. I was home two hours after I woke up in the recovery room. Crazy. Um, so I'm very, you know, I mean, I was crystal, crystal clear. I am not doing this without pain meds. End of story. I understand you want to remove it. I get it but I'm not going to do this on acetaminophen or Tylenol or Advil. Nope. And he was like, absolutely not a problem. And actually I said the same thing to the surgeon last week for my gallbladder. I said, I'm not doing it without pain meds, period. She goes, absolutely not. And I had a prescription for 15 Norco pills of which I still have one left, which I will be using. I will be cutting in quarters. And I will, I will use one this afternoon, undoubtedly. Anne says, can you have several phenotypes? Yes, definitely. Leslie said it's robotic surgery. Good. The risks with robotic surgery are very, very low, hon. Very, very low. A da Vinci robotic surgery? I mean, I, again... Why are you having it done? Do they are, do they, are they removing fibroids? Do they suspect uh, uterine cancer? What's going on there?
Um, craft Artistry on YouTube says, what are my thoughts on platelet-rich plasma treatment for hypertonic pelvic floor and IC? We don't have, we have preliminary data that's showing some success, but we don't have big double-blind clinical trials yet. I would want to know how much it costs. MK, please tell the truth about cystoscopy pain. Everybody says it's brutal. You can't have sedation, allergies, petrified, 24-7 pain, CT clear. MK, listen, hun. A plain cystoscopy in the doctor's office does, should not cause any bladder pain. It's going to hurt the urethra. So there are different types of cystoscopy. If the doctor just wants to do a plain cystoscopy, I call it a looky-loo. I've had two. All they do is numb the urethra, stick a scope in, look around, pull it out, you're done. They haven't touched your bladder wall. There is nothing in that that is going to be traumatic to the bladder wall. It is traumatic to the urethra. That's the first time you try to urinate afterwards. It's not fun. It's going to hurt. So urinating after catheterization, after a bladder installation, after any time they put something into your urethra, yes, that will hurt but it will go away usually within a few days. In contrast to hydrodistension with cystoscopy, that's where they fill your bladder with water first and they stretch your bladder, hydrodistension. They're using water, hydro, to distend the bladder. The most painful thing you can do to a hollow organ is stretch it. That is extremely painful. That is why the American Urology Association guidelines say it should be done as an outpatient procedure. Um, so would I ever allow somebody to do a hydrodistension without anesthesia? Hell no. And it, it happened to me. I had avoiding cystogram. Summer of 1993, I think it was June. My doctor wrote out specific instructions for the radiologist. Radiologist refused to read them. The doctor said, do not distend her bladder more than 250. The radiologist put a thousand cc's of fluid in my bladder and did a hydrodistension. And I was screaming like a lunatic. A lunatic. And then she said, honey, just pee it out. How the hell do you pee it out when you've got a catheter in you? And then she poured water, warm water between my legs to try to get me to pee it out with a catheter. Are you fucking kidding me? Excuse me for swearing. I was screaming in pain. And finally, she let me stand up and go empty my bladder in the toilet. And I walked out of that test shaking like a leaf, shaking like a leaf. And I got her ass fired. She was fired because of that. It was at Kaiser Permanente, Santa Rosa, summer 1993. They sent me an evaluation form for another appointment. The very next day, I filled it out. I said exactly what happened. And that doctor was fired. She deserved it. She refused to read a note from another doctor who ordered the test. So, hydro to any time they put fluid in your bladder, you should have the option to have propofol. Propofol is the perfect anesthetic. It's light, it's easy, it knocks you out quickly, and you wake up quickly, and you can pee afterward outpatient procedure. Okay, Leslie said they're doing it for pre-cancer, but they want to see if there may be some cancer. Honey, that's exactly why they did it for me too. They also, they're also taking your fallopian tubes, ovaries, and two nodes out too. Interesting. So um, I don't know why they're taking the two nodes. Um, when you have the nodes removed, that's a little bit more of an aggressive surgery. So for me, I had my biopsy results from my um, DNC showed complex endometrial hyperplasia with atypia, 
So those are the cells that turn into the cancer cells with, quote, a vague architectural complex. Kaiser sent my biopsy down to Stanford and Stanford said it's starting to build something, a tumor. So um, they, um, you know, their answer was, you have all the markers of cancer. We cannot, can, we, we do not know right now if you already have tumors in your uterus that, that we didn't see. We recommend a complete hysterectomy. And I'm like, let's, you know, of course I was stunned and said, we're going to do it. And they wanted me to drive to Sacramento, which is a two hour drive and have it, have, have it done by a, um, a gynecologic oncologist. And, but it's still an outpatient procedure. And I didn't, I couldn't imagine driving home two hours from surgery. And so I said, listen, I really don't want to do that. I want my local OBGYN to do it locally here. And so he made a deal with the oncologist and said, okay, we'll do it here locally, Jill. But if we find anything, you're going to have to go back and they're going to have to pull nodes. You're going to have to go to Sacramento and they're going to have to pull nodes. And I'm like, deal, 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 deal. We'll do it that way. So, um, you're having a robotic surgery, best case scenario. Um, so they're, a lymph node, so they might take one or two lymph nodes just to see if there's any suggestion of cancer in the lymph nodes. Reasonable. But it's not reasonable at this point in time to pull 20 nodes because that would be a lot of surgery and a lot of tissue trauma. But if there's... And, uh, it was one of the top IC doctors who said that to me. Um, and so right now you're not a cancer patient. I was not an active cancer patient. You're kind of getting the best of both worlds here. You know, so they're going to do the easy thing, but they're going to take two lymph nodes. I wouldn't say no. I mean, but I think you should go watch here. Hold on a sec. Let me... Um, I want to give you the link to the video I made on this because I told my story because your story and my stories, we had it for exactly the same reason. And the good news for me is that they did not find active tumors. They just found that early, early, the vague architectural complex. So something was happened, but happening, but they got it in the nick of time. So let me just get you that link really quick. Here it is right here. Okay, I just put it in, um, Leslie, um, I just put it in as a comment. Um, and hold on a sec. Sharon says, my doctor wants to do my cystoscope awake, and I'm so bad, I just can't. I've had one awake and out over 30 years. Sharon, again, if it's just a cysto and there's no fluid going in your bladder, I wouldn't. My doctor wanted to do that today. I would do it. I'd do it online so you could see it. I'm not worried about a cystoscopy at all. Yeah, the urethra is going to be painful, but that will go away. But if they intend to stretch my bladder in any way, shape, or form with fluid, then no, we're not doing it in the doctor's office. We're going to do it as an outpatient. So you can always, you can, I mean, you're the boss. It's your body. You decide what you want to do. You can say, listen, you want to look at my bladder? That's fine, but you're going to have to knock me out first. See if they'll schedule it as an outpatient procedure. Ann says, what's a hypertonic pelvic floor? A tight pelvic floor. Hypertonic means hypertonicity, which means it's tight. MK said she had a cervical colposcopy like that, sobbing with pain. 
Oh, honey, I, uh, yeah, I, my GNC, well, I had three different tests. Two of them were without anesthesia first, including that uterine biopsy. But once we hit the DNC level, no, that was anesthesia. Don says a colposcopy would be worse than a cystoscopy. Yeah, because a cystoscopy isn't cutting anything. You know, it's just not cutting anything. Oh, you know, my dream when I was younger is like I said, you know, because I love having red hair, but I also have always dreamed of having long white hair. It's coming true. <laughs> my white hair is coming in. So I think the stress of the last year has has got me. You know, I mean, although it's still very dark in the back, but it's definitely getting lighter around my face. Uh, Michelle says, yeah, burning after I pee sometimes. I have urge, have the urge to go after I pee. My physical therapist I, says I don't have, a, I don't, Michelle, I don't understand. Your physical therapist says you don't have a right pelvic floor. What does that mean? Do you have normal muscles or tight muscles? Thank you, MK. It depends on where my part is. If my part's over, then you can't see the white spot. All right. Well, guys, we've been going for two and a half hours. I consider that amazing. Physical therapist says you don't have tight pelvic floor muscles. Okay, so if you so then if you have burning after you pee, I would at, I would say where where is the burning? Where is the burning? Is it on your skin? Is it in your urethra, your your vagina, your vulva? Where is that burning after you pee? Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, and it's growing out again. See that? I like having it. So burning in the urethra, estrogen atrophy. That's going to be the first thing we're going to think about. I've got a really good blog on the IC Network website, the seven causes of urethral pain. So with the urethra, these are the things we're going to look for. The first thing we're going to look for is the quality and health of your skin. Again, the urethra is a canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. You're going to feel, if your urethra is dry, you're going to, it's going to feel like there's a drop of urine in your urethra that won't come out. Um, it, it's going to become progressively irritated as it gets drier and drier and drier. And that's what happened to me when I was 52. The second thing we're going to look for is chemical irritation. If I put on a pair of underwear, wash and cheer, tied within five minutes, I'll have urethral burning. Why? Because my skin is drier and more sensitive. Some people, especially if you wear mini pads, uh, um, react to the chemicals in the mini pads. You know, the flatter the pad, which makes them more comfortable, the more chemicals that are in it. So what happens is, number one, that mini pad is going to pull moisture off of your vulva, which you need. And that's where, you know, using vulva balm is really, really good because this will give you an extra layer of protection that will protect the moisture of your, the natural moisture of your skin. So wearing mini pads every day is sucky for the vulva, for a woman, especially if you're an older woman. So use something like vulva balm to protect it. Um, so we want to look for that chemical irritation. For some women, they get... Uh, a redness exactly the shape of the mini pad and gynecologists see it all the time. The third thing we're going to look for is tight pelvic floor muscles. If your levator anal muscles are tight, they're going to squeeze your urethra and, and tight muscles burn. If you feel like you're trying to pee through a needle, that's a sign that your muscles are very tight. If your flow is not natural, that's a sign that your muscles are tight. You know, pee envy, when you go to the public toilet and you're sitting there stopping and starting, stopping and starting, somebody comes in next to you and pees like a horse and you're going, how do you do that? I've never peed like a horse. That's a sign of tight pelvic floor muscles. 
Um, we want to look for an in infection in the periurethral gland. This is land, you know, your urethra is kind of the shape of your little finger and about halfway up the urethra on the outside of the urethra is a little gland. It's the female prostate gland we call the periurethral gland that can be infected. Um, and it feels like a deep pimple. But you can easily find that yourself just by inserting your finger in your vagina. And you palpate the, uh, just not far, like an inch, because remember, your urethra is short, so you only have to put your finger in about this much. So if you stick your urethra in your vagina along the front side of your vagina, if you feel any tender lumps, it feels exactly like a deep pimple that you cannot pop. That's an infected gland. Okay, that's, uh, that's tricky because they have to try to drain that land. And basically, it's, uh, so they will have a, a, a metal sound in your urethra. They will have a finger in your vagina and they will push it. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Jenny says, burning is in my urethra too. Estrogen atrophy. Uh, the odds. Sharon said, I had two whole rounds of GMSO years ago. Well, we know GMSO is pointless at this point in time. 85% of IC patients are neuromuscular. GMSO would mean nothing for them. I did GMSO too. It did nothing for me. Why? Because I have a healthy bladder. It's never my bladder. It's always been my muscles and nerves. Dawn says, until my pain, majority urethra and started and started on birth control, any estrogen causes burning. Even compounded gives me a mood swing too. Well, Don, you're having what we call a, uh, what's the word, a paradoxical reaction to the estrogen, which means that the opposite of what was intended might be happening, might be happening. I'm not sure. I would encourage you to come on over to the IC Network website and just Google urethra on our website, search for urethra on our website and read that blog on the seven causes of urethral pain. And maybe we'll find another cause because honestly, listen, laundry detergent, fabric softener, uh, any of those could cause urethral pain in a woman who's getting older. You should not be using anything that makes your underwear smell good. That's leaving a chemical residue in your underwear that's going to irritate that skin down there. So no fabric softeners. Literally, you got to go to a free and clear. I use seventh generation free and clear, and I usually wash, rinse my underwear twice to get any chemical residue out. And I can remember I was visiting a friend in New York, and I had just come back from an IC conference in Europe, and um, I stopped in New York, in New Jersey, actually. And I needed underwear, and she said, I'll wash it. And... It, she washed it and tied, and then she used a fabric softener. Oh, my God. I wore that underwear on the flight home. It was agony. You know how sometimes you put something on before work, and then you're driving to work, and you're going, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> this isn't going to work. I, there's something in this is making my skin, that's bothering my skin. Hey, John. John says, I've had urethral burning since this started 21 months ago. I'm getting physical therapy, acupuncture, which are helping with my tight pelvic floor. As a 65-year-old man, is there any chance my urethra would benefit from some, some kind of cream? Thank you. You know, John, um, urethritis is actually also quite common in men. Um, urethritis, it, it basically means that we have an inflammation of the urethra potentially from a chemical, so some spermicides are known for irritating the urethra and the skin, as well as, of course, simple laundry detergents and fabric softener. So we want to back off on any chemical exposures down there for a good chunk of time, like a good three to six months. Even even a condom, a latex condom. You know, latex latex allergy sometimes can begin at any any time. So we want to make sure that we've ruled that out. I'm actually sitting on the uh, American Urology Association Committee 
creating new guidelines for men just like you, men with pelvic pain. Um, it's a tremendous honor. I'm really, really happy to do it. Um, the fact that you have very, very tight pelvic floor muscles comes as no surprise because I will tell you in my office, 95% of the men that I work with, and I work with many, many men, it all goes back to an old athletic or physical a traumatic injury. I can remember I was working with a paratrooper from Vietnam who, you know, um, I forget the, he, he was in the 82nd Airborne. And he jumped out of planes many, many times. And he landed on his butt many, many times. But one time in particular, it's very, very bad. He landed fast, hard, landed right on his tailbone. And he had all of these symptoms too. And in our work, we really now very, very clearly understand that for the great majority of men out there, we're, it's really more of a traumatic injury situation. So being on that physical therapy, it's so incredibly important. We got to get that pelvic floor relaxed and normal again. One of the things, so the question that you've got to ask your physical therapist are my muscles responding or are they always locking back down into tension? Because if your muscles are always locking back down into tension, we have to take a step back from the muscles and we have to look at bones. So very interestingly, like two years ago, two or three years ago, we had a study of men with, with pelvic pain. 70% of them had a hip problem. Seven, seven zero had a hip problem and they had to go over to orthopedics to get that either hip joint, SI joint, tailbone, sacrum, etc., to get that looked at. So when muscles are not responding to hands-on work, we have to start looking at what puts long-term consistent pressure on muscles, bones. Do we have a bad hip? Do we have a bad SI joint? Do we have a bad tailbone? So as an example, if we look at this model, what a lot of people don't understand, so here's the back. So here we have the vertebrae from the spinal cord. Then we've got the big triangular sacrum, which is fused vestigial um, uh, discs, right? Um, vertebrae. And then at the bottom, we have the tailbone, right? Here's the tailbone. And you'll notice that the tailbone in the human curves under just like it does in, in animals born. Um, so the tailbone is actually the center of the pelvis. But what a lot of people don't understand is that the tailbone it's connected to a lot of muscles. So if you have a broken tailbone and that tailbone is skewed to the left or to the right, and it's not centered, that's going to cause the muscles on one side to be stretched out and tight. And sometimes after tailbone injury, we lose the curve in and it will go straight downwards or it will stick out that also is going to really tweak these pelvic floor muscles. So as the physical therapist, are my muscles responding or am I always locking back down into tension? Now there's another piece of this puzzle here, so hold on a sec. This is, this is the book for you called Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain. This is written for men and women. This was written by Dr. Jerome Wise, who was a first urologist back 30 years ago to recognize the role that muscles play. He saw the bladder treatments didn't work for the vast majority of patients. Why? Because usually it's something underneath the bladder or that's or affecting, the, there's usually something else that's affecting the bladder. One of the things that he says in, in, in this book is Western medicine fails the typical pelvic pain patient. Why? Because doctors play in their sandbox. If you go to a urologist, they're gonna assume it's your prostate. 
you go to a gastroenterologist, they're going to assume your bowel. And for many women, their doc gynecologist will assume that it's a problem with reproductive tract. And as he explained so clearly in this book, nothing operates in isolation in the pelvis. Everything influences everything. I mean, the pelvic cavity, this is a very small cavity. And there's a lot happening in this cavity. You've got your major organ. You've got big, very, very important muscles. And there are big nerves. And there are big blood vessels. And as he says, nothing operates in isolation. It's all about influence. What became the mystery of his career that he dedicated the last 15 years of his career to was why do some patients always lock back down in detention? No matter, and listen, he was a master with muscles. If you walked into his clinic with tight muscles, I can promise you, you would have walked out feeling much better, magician with his hand. He wanted to know why it came back. Why does it come back? So that's when he started looking at bones, and he talks a lot about that. Makes sense. Maybe there's a bad hip, bad SI joint. Something we often see in guys. Um, this is a really good picture of what happens if you ride uh, bicycles or motorcycles. You can see this motorcycle seat directly pushing up into nerves and muscles. Right? Because again, when we look at our model, and what, what guy hasn't ridden a motorcycle or ridden bikes? If we look at the bottom of the pelvis, here's your sit bones. So these are the only bones that carry your weight when you sit down. That bike seat pushes directly into muscles and nerves. Okay. So anyway, he sought to figure out why do muscles always lock back down. And he, made, he finally he made the ultimate discovery with the help of, of all people, a podiatrist. That the vast majority of patients who struggle with long-term muscle tension were not walking normally. That it was all about how their foot hit the ground. The forces of a bad footstep get redirected up the leg right into the pelvis and cause tension. And I want you to see this picture. So, whoops, hold on. Okay, so here is, whoops, this is the healthy leg. So you can see that when the leg hits the ground correctly, the, the leg, the foot and the leg are in a 90 degree angle, goes straight up, and then it skews a little bit to the side where the top of the femur is attached to the hip. So look, there is a healthy, normal piriformis muscle which connects to the top of the femur. But look at this side. This piriformis muscle is tight and stretched out. And when we come down, you'll notice that the femur is pushing farther out to the side than normal. When we go all the way to the foot, we can see that ankle, we can see the angle starting right at the foot when the ankle rolls in. So if you have an ankle that rolls inward, look at what that does. It goes all, redirects that angle all the way up into the pelvis, and it causes the pelvic floor to stretch out massively on that one side. So what he found is that when they corrected how that patient was walking, the pelvic floor went back to normal. So again, if you were an athlete in the military, you remember any trauma. If you were riding bikes, motor, riding motorcycles, we're always looking at muscles. Ask that physical therapist, is it responding or is it always locking back down in detention? It's locking back down in detention. We got to look at bones. You can buy this book on the in the IC Network shop. It's $6 cheaper than Amazon because 
we have a, a deal with the doctor who's now 85 years old, wonderful doctor. Um, and this is his love letter to patients. Now that he's retired, he wanted to give you a roadmap. Um, the other thing you could do, uh, urethral pain, pain at the tip of the penis is often referred pain from that muscle. Uh, you could do a topical lidocaine cream. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest is something like Allopath in our shop or Piora in our shop, both of which have PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide, which can calm nerves down in the urethra. Worth a shot at least. But remember, I'm not a doctor. I can't give you medical advice. All I can do is make some suggestions. And I'd be happy to talk to you. I talk to guides all the time. Um, Michelle says, when I apply estriol cream, it irritates me and makes the urgency worse. Estradiol did the same thing. I would want to know how bad your skin is compromised, hon. Jenny said, I tried the vaginal estrogen last year and had a huge uptake in migraine, so I had to stop. Is there something else I could use? Uh, you coconut oil or vulva balm. Why don't you try the vulva balm? You can get it in the IC Network shop. Really, really good. And that will at least protect it. Uh, Jenny said, I broke my tailbone years ago. They missed it on the original x-ray. Years later, it was still hurting. They took another x-ray, showed a heel break. It, that's what I have. I broke my tailbone into two pieces. And that's when all my symptoms started in seventh grade. John said, I believe my pelvic floor is improving with physical therapy. I will have my pelvis, hips, tailbone looked at. Thank you so much. Uh, my physical therapist was working with me one day when she pressed on the area where my genitofemoral nerve is. I instantly felt the burning sensation I feel when I'm flaring it during ur urination. So that really confirms that you're really a pudendal neuralgia patient, that you have a muscle squeezing nerves. And uh, let me show you this. Sorry, John, if you came in late, I'm recovering from having my gallbladder removed last week. So I'm going slow. This, this is a thing that I think would be really worth you trying because it calms nerves down. Uh, P, uh, PEA 500, known as Piora. Uh, there are dozens of studies with this, with acute pain, surgical pain, chronic pain. You know, um, and in ice, we have a... a three, no, two prostatitis studies, prostate pain studies, one male pelvic pain study with PEA. No, there were no side effects reported in the great majority of studies. Uh, no known drug interactions. It acts by calming nerves down. And um, this is what I take um, every night. Uh, but then I go off of it for a month or so. And I have found that the results should be very durable, the results long term. So what's interesting is that I, well, I, I've been taking it uh, for like, again, I mean, I've taken it off and on for the last three years. I think I stopped it in January. I started again in February or somewhere in there. Anyway, I've been taking this every night with my post-recovery surgical pain. Everybody's stunned at how much better I'm doing than the most, most patients. I mean, I had an emergency surgery. I've got five incisions seven days ago. I was up and walking two days after the surgery. Why? I mean, they're stunned. Well, I think it's the PEA, <laughs> to be quite honest. I think it's the PEA. Um, and we've got the studies to back it up. It acts really good at calming nerves down. So um, anyway, that would be, and, and the other great thing is it's very, very affordable. It's under $30 for a month's supply. So that would be very, very interesting. Don says, my pain is urethral and started, started on, or let's say, we talked about that. I'm wondering if you're having an allergic reaction to it. I, I don't know, hon. I don't know. John said, I had three pudendal nerve blocks done that unfortunately didn't help. That's why I thought it may be the genitofemoral nerve you're here for doing this while recovering from surgery. I'm very, you're very welcome, John. Girl, I've been there. I mean, I've been there. That's why I do this. 
I don't want any, anybody to suffer like I suffered. And I don't want anybody to be told that this is all in their heads. And here's the deal, John. A lot of guys are dismissed. I had a guy in my support group whose doctor told him not to tell his family that he had pain. He said the more he talked about it, the worse he'd get it. And this man had severe pain. And for five years, he told no one. And he suffered. And he reached out to me. And I was like, what the hell? You need comfort. You need support. You need a hell of a lot better doctor than somebody who told you to stop talking about it and it'll go away. And the single most important phone call I got, I've gotten in this job, and I've done this for 30 years, from a, was from a man who was sobbing. Like I literally answered the phone, hey, Jill, IC Network, can I help you? I had a man who was sobbing. And I whispered to him, just calmed him down for about several minutes. What he said stunned me. He said, I am the chief of one of the biggest trauma units on the East Coast. And I have IC and I have bladder pain and I have told no one. And I said, why? He said, because they laugh and they believe it's all in their head. If I tell them, I will lose all of my credibility. And then he started sobbing again. I mean, big, giant tears. And I created a confidential support group on our website that we ran, we ran for about 20 years for people who were in uh, professions where they just didn't want it to become known publicly. So I worked with, I worked with congressmen, I worked with famous actors, I worked with Broadway stars, I worked with the squadron commander of an F-16 unit in Afghanistan um, to give guys a place where, they, uh, well, men and women, a place where they could talk about it in total anonymity. Um, and that was the single most important phone call in my life doing this work. And whenever I give lectures to doctors, that is what I lead with. And I'm in a big lecture series right now with the International Continent Society and we're lecturing on pelvic pain around the world. I tell that story every single time. You were hurt, you have a physical injury not in your head. And having, so you would fit IC subtype three, I mean, IC subtype three and four, which is pelvic floor dysfunction, pudendal neuralgia. And, and so this makes this book all the more relevant for you. Please get it. Please read it. It's going to be so incredibly encouraging. It's filled with success stories. And let me, you know what? Let me just see if I can find one. Let me just read it. It's just great, great success stories. I want to find a guy's success story, though. I mean, there are just so many. I'm wearing, I'm not wearing the right glasses to read, though. So do I even have, oh, yeah, I have my reading glasses on. Hold on. You get to see my reading glasses. This whole section on bike riding, clitoridinia, phallodynia. In recent years, I've seen many clitoral and penile pain patients who were previously treated without success by relatively enlightened practitioners. Many of these practitioners firmly believed that the pelvic muscles were the cause of the patient's problem and were convinced that they could eventually alleviate genital pain by treating the muscles exclusively. While light years ahead of the all-in-your-head all bias, this dedicated myofascial approach does not always provide enduring relief. And I have observed that it seldom does in cases of clitoral and penile pain. This is because severe pudendal neuralgia, possibly entrapment, is generally the primary cause and generally requires treatment with nerve blocks and accompanying mobilization supplemented as needed with myofascial therapy. I must confess, confess that I too once believed that the muscles were the primary cause of most pelvic pain syndromes, including clitoral and penile pain. In fact, the original working title of this book was the M factor, M meaning myofascial. In recent years, however, my awareness of pudendal nerve pathology has grown exponentially 
Knowing what I know now, I'm finding the pudendal nerve to be the immediate culprit in most cases of clitoral and penile pain, also numbness based on solid clinical results. Other causes of clitoral penile pain, horseback riding, habitually sitting on hard, uneven, or uncomfortable surfaces. I'll tell you, I had a guy call me and he said, whenever I sit at my desk at my comp uh, um, at work, my, my penis starts vibrating and it vibrates so severely that it knocks me off my chair. He said, do you know what this is? I went, yeah, I know exactly what that is. That's pudendal neuralgia. The act of sitting is compressing that nerve. That's causing that vibration. There's also something called double crush syndrome. So um, anyway, so the causes of pleural penile pain, horseback riding, habitually sitting on hard, uneven, or uncomfortable surfaces, gynecologic, urologic, proctologic, or hip surgeries, chronic constipation, sagging pelvic floor, pain referred to the pudendal nerve can irritate and inflame it, stress or injured obturator muscles or piriformis muscles, tight dysfunctional pelvic muscles. The double crush syndrome is a fascinating neurological phenomenon that explains why most of the above bulleted pain sources can produce rectal, perineal, clitoral, and penile pain. It also explains why patients with symptoms related to one branch of the pudendal nerve, such as sit bone pain, can then develop symptoms related to another branch, such as rectal pain, and in some cases end up with problems in all three branches of the nerve. The simplicity of symptoms occurs because when movement is restricted in the nerve's main trunk, or in any of its three primary branches. Uh, alterations in tension and movement can also occur in other branches, causing pain or numbness in the structures they supply. Additionally, compression can damage the main component of the nerve fibers, making it exceptionally vulnerable to the pressures that are normal encountered. And he said, I introduced this in chapter 10. I cite an example an avid cyclist named Bill, whose pudendal nerve trunk was, trunk was entrapped between the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. Uh, Bill's initial symptom was left uh, buttock and tailbone pain caused by compressed perineal branch. Then he developed burning around the anus caused by the rectal branch. Finally, awoke one night in severe penile pain that landed him in the ER. This is the book for you, my friend. This is a book for anybody who's dealing with muscle and nerves down there. It's so incredibly good. All right. Okay, well, we've been going for about three hours, and I think that I have hit my end. I have a quarter of a Norco waiting for me. So I'm going to do a last call for questions, last call for questions. Otherwise, I want to thank you so much for watching today. And for those of you who um, I need a little bit more support, you're always welcome to give me a phone call, IC Network. And please visit our website. Um, I believe it or not, people are always surprised when I answer, my, answer the phone. Believe me, I do. I don't have a secretary who answers the phone for me. Not that I wouldn't like one. <laughs> um, you know, we're a grassroots group. We've got three employees. And my other, I've got one employee who does our books and another employee who, who does our fulfillment. And then I do all the front, front, uh, front end work with patients and with providers. Um, so if you like what we do, please think about buying something in the IC Network shop or becoming a member where you can get our fabulous magazine, The IC Optimist which is where we do our best work. I don't put all the articles from the IC Optimist on our website. The big ones often do not come on our website for at least six months of a year. That's because, I hate to break it to you, but I got bills to pay. <laughs> so we, you know, we need the income too. So you can also make a donation to the ICN shop. But as always, this meeting is free. They've always had, they always have been free. Because, um, I don't want you to believe that you have to pay thousands of dollars to learn about IC. You don't. The IC network has been rated the best, most accurate, reliable website on IC. In two peer-reviewed studies, one, by, one done by Harvard Children Hospital, the other done by the University of London. 
There are people online right now offering classes. They're getting a lot of that information from me, free from me. And they have the audacity to charge you for it. It's free. Um, so please come on over and use our website. Sign up for our newsletter. And we just, we're just here to help, all right? Okay, my friends, I'll see you later. Have a good one. I'm going to say goodbye to YouTube first. And if anybody wants to play Fortnite, send me an email, icnetwork at mac.com. We got a, a small but fun group of ICers who play Fortnite. I play Fortnite too. It's a great way to de-stress. icnetwork at mac.com.